everyone to episode two of the two Abdullahs with Abdullah Gondal and Abdullah Samir. You're two friendly neighborhood ex-Muslims here to present a very bang on topic, slavery in Islam. A very serious topic and highly relevant, especially with all of the Black, Sli Black Lives Matters, the racism, you know, all of the activism that's going on right now towards freedom of um, not, not just freedom of religion, but also, you know, treating people as equals, no matter what, what color the skin is. Black, Black Lives Matter or the whole movement shows you that we humans actually care about fairness, about justice, about equality. And some Muslims have actually taken to kind of appropriate this whole thing and say Islam is against slavery. Sorry, Islam is against racism, but they forget that Islam actually allows slavery. So we're going to go into it. We're going to, it's going to be a very hot topic, uh, a very interesting one. And uh, at, at some point we're going to take calls as well. So we're going to share the link and uh, please invite your fellow Muslim, especially um, to call in and ask questions. It doesn't have to be on the topic, but it'd be preferred if it is. Um, but we will we will take questions, um, a few questions here and there, and we have a very interesting stream that we're both working on. Okay, Abdullah Gondal, um, how's it going? Hey, everybody. Uh, glad to be back here a second time, and hope you enjoyed today's installment of the show. Uh, today's show is going to be very, very uh, interesting because we found some incredibly weird and bizarre narrations, especially surrounding the topic of sex slavery. And this isn't limited to the companions of the prophet or the people who lived around him. The prophet himself indulged in it with full heartedness uh, and he actually had concubines. Um, so before we get into the details, I just wanna make a few points clear is uh, how slavery ties into moral relativism. So for example, if you were to ask somebody, a Muslim today, is slavery uh, immoral? Objectively, most of them will say, oh, it's immoral. But then you ask them, well, what about the prophet doing it? Then they're like, oh, it was okay back in that time. As soon as you say that, you're just becoming a moral relativist. Now, keeping in mind, if you can't prove your God or that your God is actually giving you objective moral commands, from an external perspective, your morality is indistinguishable from moral relativism in a sense that you only have like uh, a man who's making these claims about morality, these subjective claims, and he's attributing them to God. Uh, so from an external perspective, the Islamic morality becomes very uh, subjective. Uh, one of the other interesting thing is it evolves slowly. And this is something we see with, uh, with humans uh, coming up with moral ideas as well, where, for example, take alcohol, all right? Uh, alcohol was first allowed, then it was then banned for prayer, then it was fully banned uh, to the point where some Sahaba would be drunk in the, in the in battles of Ohad and whatnot, right? Uh, this slow progression of, uh, of morality and moral changes also gives in to the idea that, yeah, uh, in fact, the theistic framework is very relativistic. It's just that the people don't realize it. Now, the problem is, why criticize Muhammad? If Muhammad was just a man of his time, is it worth even criticizing him for things that people did just like him? The point is, Muhammad doesn't claim to be just a man of his time, and nor do Muslims. Muslims and the Quran in Surah 33, verse 21, it says that he's the best example for all times to come for all or anybody who believes in the last day. Once this claim is made, that's when we have to start criticizing Muhammad because we can now identify that the ideas and concepts found in Islamic morality are unsuitable for modern society. It just, it just is. Uh, you can then say, well, my, my morality and my moral judgments are subjective. Yeah, of course, we make axioms and we go off of those. For example, I can say my moral axiom would be uh, increasing human happiness at a societal and individual level. And some people have other, uh, other axioms. But generally, at the end of the day, the point that needs to be understood, that morality is just another biological adaptation of the mind that helps us survive. This, this is all it is. 
and humans then agree on what parts and what rules we collectively choose. Uh, and then there's the functionalist approach to morality as well that is adopted by a lot of anthropologists that no moral framework is inherently better or worse than another one, but it serves to do the function, i.e., uh, does it help that tribe or those people in that time survive or aid their survival? You know, so that's the functionalist approach. Uh, now, another question I just want to get out of the way is Muslims will say, well, Islam couldn't ban slavery right away because it was too common and too rampant in society. But this strikes me as a very, very uh, wrong point because Islam did ban a lot of other things that were very rampant in society, like alcohol, like usury, i.e. riba, like idolatry, fortune telling, and a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, thank you, Sandra. Thanks for the shout out. Uh, love you too. For those who don't know, that's my wife. <laughs> She's watching our stream. Um, but the point is that this uh, this lack of prioritization that you see from this omnipotent, omniscient God does not make sense. Where he's banning every other vice in the Arab society that is bad, but then he leaves slavery, or he's just as a, just, just he doesn't even actually mention slavery once in the Quran in a bad light. It's always mentioned as a sign of the believers in Surah Mu'minun, and then the Prophet can do it. It's a prophetic thing. Uh, so with this backdrop out of the out of the way, what we will get to is uh, get into the deep end of things where we were going to delve into questions like, do sex slaves get to give consent? Does their consent matter? How does that chime in with rape and our modern understanding of slavery? And then we'll also get into, did Muhammad have slaves? Did the Sahaba have slaves? Did they indulge in extramarital sexual affairs with these slaves? And did their wives object? So it will be an interesting thing. So I will pass the microphone back to Samir now. Great. And then we can start in uh, with, the, okay. with the presentation. You made some very good disclaimers. I just want to add a little bit to them. Um, the What you said about man of his time, this is very, very important because Jonathan Brown and others have talked about this as well. And they say, well, you guys are being unfair. You're projecting your values from today's time backwards onto Islamic society of the seventh century. Uh, Muhammad had slaves assorted whatever thomas jefferson or george washington or whatever abraham lincoln i don't even know like a bunch of famous men from history and are we gonna are we gonna condemn all of them yeah we could condemn them but there's a difference the difference is that muhammad was collected by allah muhammad is the only man in history who was considered the the final prophet the final guide for mankind the best example the one that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to and will correct him when he goes astray if he does anything wrong even According to Sunni uh, understanding, even as much as frowning at a man, like the blind man frowning at him, Allah corrected him. Allah corrected the companions when they stayed too long in his house. And they were bothering him because he wanted to go and spend time with his wife, wives. So this is a man that had God, the creator of the universe, watching over him saying this is going to be the final message the final example for all of humanity forever and ever now you're saying you're going to compare that to george washington thomas jefferson like random non-muslims that like did a bunch of shit and did some good things too mm -hmm. so <laughs> like you can't compare the problem is muhammad is is a is the the, is, is a pinnacle of creation, the Sayyid, the master of humanity. So when we ex-Muslims or non-Muslims are, are criticizing Muhammad, we're allowed to do that because that's the claim you're making. Islam is making a claim and it's a very tall order, right? The other thing is just quickly, of the whole thing about Islamic values. So in, in the debate yesterday between... Um, kind of hardline Muslim and the apostate prophet, you know, he kept saying that Islamic values are good for society. Look at you guys, your families are falling apart, blah, blah, blah. And this point, like, is a big, is a big sticking point to this is good for society. Slavery is good for society. It's good for Muslim women that a man can have slaves. Is it really good for society? Is this good for Muslim women? Is this good for humanity? It's not. 
but let's let's go to the presentation and let's uh, let's see how what we have there. And uh, as Gondol mentioned, we're going to take some some questions, but we're just we're going to go to a bit of this presentation first. So Jonathan Brown in his book, I never finished his book, but just to define slavery, it's a little bit tricky to define it, but it's basically an involuntary relationship of mutual dependence between two quite unequal partners. Mm -hmm. So there's a master and a slave. The unequal, there's a there's an imbalance of power right there. So that's that's very important to know know that these are not equals. Mm -hmm. Why is slavery a problem? Why are we even talking about slavery? Jonathan Brown again says, ISIS's reasoning on slavery cut deep because it was so clean. ISIS claimed to be the caliphate reborn, reestablishing the Sharia according to the book of God and the way of his messenger. The Quran had allowed slavery. Prophet Muhammad had slaves. And all of this had been allowed by the Sharia. So why shouldn't ISIS do it? This is a very good question. And this is a question that troubled many Muslims and troubled him, which is why he wrote the book. Because you have something that claims to be this ultimate moral authority, yet it's doing things that's, that, that seem wrong. <laughs> Are they equal? So this was also mentioned in the book that when Jonathan Brown, when he first read this, and he was a non-Muslim, or he was converting to Islam, Allah sets forth the parable of two men, one a slave under the dominion of another. He has no power of any sort, and the other a man on whom we have bestowed goodly favors. Goodly favors here includes having slaves, okay? And he spends there freely, publicly, and privately. He's a free man. He can spend his money however he want. Are the two equal? So Jonathan Brown actually said in his mind, he was thinking, aren't they equal? They're not. <laughs> Good question. Are they equal? Yeah. Well, it's, it's it's interesting seeing that this power imbalance that is acknowledged by uh, by Muslim scholars and the Quran itself, and we actually see constantly that uh, Allah keeps saying that this the believing men it's there is a sign of piety to uh, have sex slaves apparently in Surah Mu'minun. Yeah. Right. And then the, 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 it's 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 so interesting that this power imbalance exists and people don't see an issue with it. Like you should have an issue if you're saying that you're the slave of Allah, you're the abd of Allah. Well, anybody who's the abd of you is still a it's it's, it's a power imbalance that should trouble you. And you can't be trading humans as commodities or properties where sometimes he would trade like two black slaves or one non-black slave or seven slaves for one slave girl, right? So it's evident that uh, slaves aren't put on the same pedestal in terms of equality uh, as equal uh, uh, free humans or free, free men and women. And that is very, very sad. This is just just not right you shouldn't do that one of the other if we were to go like this worse nine slave uh, nine five it says that wherever you find them and capture them this brings back the point where a lot of slavery is tied with the uh, prisoners of war in islam what normally happens is uh, you may attack a tribe or be partaking in jihad but once you uh, win the war you capture the men and the women you can then take the men and the women as slaves. You can then uh, have sex with them. You can sell them. You can uh, trade them for weapons and, uh, and uh, horses and other things. And this is very important because we, we will get uh, later into this that if a caliphate exists and a Muslim a war broke out against the Kuffar, many scholars still argue that the quran actually never banned slavery yeah. yeah so they can still take slaves even in the 21st century if a, if a caliphate comes and that's exactly why isis is slavery model was a problem because theologically they are still okay in theory mm -hmm. anyways let's go on Ooh, uh, that's the worst I was talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. So literally, this whole surah at the beginning. So, uh, the beginning, yeah, the beginning of the surah says successful are the believers. It's praising the believers. And then it goes on to the signs of the believers. And one of the signs, it says, then they guide their, uh, guard their private parts. So they, 
they don't indulge in uh, sex outside marriage and zina and whatnot. But then it says, except from their wives or those their right hand possesses, meaning you can have sex with your slaves. And this is very, very well known. Now, this hadith embodies one of uh, one of the deepest problems in Islamic sex slavery. If you read this, it says that uh, we went out with the Messenger of Allah for the Ghazwa of Banu al Mustalik, and we received captives from the Arab captives, and we desired women, and celibacy became hard on us, and we loved to do coitus interruptus. So, when we intended to do coitus interruptus, we said, how can we do coitus interrupt us before asking Allah's messenger who is among us? And he said, it's better for you not to do so. <laughs> and any soul that is predestined will be born anyways. What ends up happening here is these Muslim men go on to this jihad and they're away from their wives. And another version of the hadith also says that they captured excellent Arab women. That was the wording. And celibacy became hard on them but they also wanted to keep ransoming these women after. So that's why they were doing the coitus interruptus. There is a specific version that oh. says that. Sorry, I edited and I put this one instead. My right. bad. Well, <laughs> and I'll find that one, but I want to so, show you because just yeah. to get the extent of, uh, of how deep this that's a good point the, the reason why let's we, we should be clear about that. The reason why they didn't, they didn't want these women to get pregnant because if they got pregnant, they can't sell them. Right, they yeah. can't get money from the slaves. So basically, they yeah. want to have the cake and eat it too. I'm going to share the exact one I'm talking about. And in the modern in the modern world, ISIS took this further. They, uh, I mean, I I hate to even talk about this, but they they basically said that if you use condoms, then there's no waiting period, because then you know that the slave is not pregnant, so you can sell her right away. So okay. you don't need can to. Can you see my uh, screen now? No, not yet. Uh, one second. Here. Okay. All right. So that's the hadith I found. And this one, it says, uh, we went out with Allah's messenger and took some captive, excellent Arab women. And we desired them. So literally, these haba are horny. They're perverted horny. <laughs> and... I don't know what that was. Sorry about that. Skype, yeah, yeah. So basically, the 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 basically saying that they wanted to sleep with these with these women, and uh, they 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 basically yeah the out of war or whatever, and they didn't want to um, to wait until they got back home, right? Yeah, and it was, it was, it was they're trying to say that they're literally desiring ransom for them. But that's why they're pulling out because they don't want to get them pregnant so they can sell them later on. Yeah. Which is just, just crazy. Just reading this, it shows that these people were also said to be the moral champions. Like, you know, the people that Allah has said that they that he's pleased with them. These are the flag bearers of the best moral champions in the Islamic civilization. And you can see these people indulging in such low, horrible actions. It's It's so, so, so sad. So yeah, let's continue the presentation. Ooh, all right. This one's an interesting one. Um, this was found in, this is actually in Imam Malik's Mu'atta. Uh, what happens here is a man comes to Umar ibn al-Khattab and says, I have a slave girl and I used to have intercourse with her. My wife went to her and suckled her, meaning she breastfed her because suckling back in the day, remember, there are verses in the Quran that said, if you suckle somebody, they become your mahram, i.e. you cannot marry them or have sexual relationships with them anymore. So this wife, she was jealous of this, her husband having sex with the slave girl. She went and suckled the slave girl to make her her daughter so that her husband can't continue having sex with her. So the guy then complains, when I went to the girl, my wife told me to watch out because she had suckled her. Now, this is hilarious. Omar told him to go beat his wife and to go to his slave girl because kinship by suckling was only by the suckling of the young. So Omar says, no, 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 go back and keep having sex with your concubine because your wife is wrong. This is just, just outrageous. Like, what is even going on here? Huh. Uh, 
so what we'll do is we'll play this uh, this little clip about from Dr. Shabir Ali where he uh, discusses consent and sex slaves. And after that, what we will do is we'll start taking questions and calls, and then we'll see uh, if you can get a Muslim and have him explain how he feels about all of this. Okay, let me let me mute you and see if I can get this to work. And is there how does this consent play into this at all? If I do, can we? understand anything about consent from the sun like does a um, female slave have to consent to to that or is it kind of like because she's owned and so therefore... in, in the classical thought uh, the the understanding is that by virtue of the fact that she's owned uh, she she does not have the right to to consent uh, she uh, or to withhold herself from her master uh, the master has the full right over her and her consent does not play anything in in this uh, relationship um, we should uh, understand that in the ancient world, women did not have many rights, and and even marriage was not uh, as we might expect it today, like a, a relationship uh, of uh, equality between spouses. Uh, so in, in the Quran itself, a woman is uh, uh, her husband is referred to as her baal, which uh, literally means her lord. The interpreters uh, thought of female slaves as having a secondary status, even below this. And and that and that you know their consent did not matter in this relationship. They were fully owned, mm -hmm. and the master had the right to all of the women. In in essence, uh, generally in in classical Islamic uh, thought, it, it is taken for granted that uh, a, a Muslim man uh, can have uh, up to four wives at once. In addition, in addition to the four wives, he can have an unlimited number of concubines. Um, which uh, refer to women who are basically uh, have they have slave status uh, when they are owned by her master. Uh, a woman owned by her master um, has to freely give of herself to to the master. The master has the right to have uh, sexual relations with her as though she were one of his wives. The believers are those who uh, guard their private parts, except from their their wives and what their right hands possess uh, but curiously enough uh, while uh, this is often interpreted to mean that a man could have sexual rela relations with his female slaves it, it is never interpreted to mean that a woman uh, could have sexual relations with her male slaves okay do you want to make some comments let me make some comments first um i was honestly shocked when you sent this to me because I couldn't believe to, I couldn't believe Dr. Shabir Ali of all the people was saying this because Shabir Ali is known as a sort of progressive among Sunnis. He, he, he's said things like stoning adulterers is not part of Islam. That was invented later. He says things like it's not haram to get a mortgage because you're, and he finds a way of kind of interpreting the Quran in a way that says those who consume riba, therefore it's only the the banks that are in trouble, not the ones paying the riba. He ignores the hadith. Like he's done a lot of cherry picking in the past. So I was shocked to hear him with a straight face talking to this Muslim woman. Yup, Islam says we can have sex with slaves and she has to, her consent doesn't matter. In fact, she has to give herself willingly, her whole body um you know women wives uh, and then he said you know back then women didn't have much rights I, you know he's basically saying in islam <laughs> well basically like i said he actually does the same exact thing the point i made in the beginning moral relativism he doesn't get it or he's not seeing it that as soon as he says well back then it was okay yeah that's what it becomes <laughs> the video, like you said, I, when I first saw it, it's from 2016, but I came across it like a few years later and I was just walk, going through my old notes and I came across it again, just watching it again. It was wow. And like you said, it's a horror show. Like that video was just terrible. Like he straight up acknowledges that like, raping of uh, sex slaves was common. And then he actually goes into detail where he says that uh, even marital rape with free women is their consent is almost non-existent in Islam as well, where Allah is always saying that uh, if a husband wants sex and his wife says no, then the angels curse her till the morning or the hadith where she's riding a camel or cooking food in the kitchen and the husband wants sex, she has to be ready right away. Now he says that if you lower the slaves even below that, they have next to no 
No right, yeah. and I mean the, this. This is you cannot defend the idea that with the power imbalance that exists between the master and the slave, and then the slave doesn't really get to consent. And a lot of times, what also people need to understand here, and I keep telling Muslims to watch this TV series called The Hands Made Tale. Why? Because there's a huge psychological component to slavery that Muslims, because they just they just completely miss. Um, and this show will give you that even though despite from the outside appearance, the slave has to put on the show that she's happy and she agrees and whatnot, the psychological trauma these people are put through is insane. So what I'm trying to get to is meaningful consent is very important. An, an example is, uh, let's say, uh, Rehana, right? Like where Muhammad uh, captures her and then says, be my slave or marry me, right? And I'm, what is she supposed to say? You killed her whole tribe like that day, right? Or Safiya, you kill, you torture her family, and then you tell her, hey, will you marry me? Obviously, at that point, the person is so traumatized, they can't give you meaningful consent. They're so coerced and so psychologically manipulated. If she says, no, I don't want to marry you, then what? Safiya stays as, stays as a slave with this guy she was already given to? Do you understand? Yeah. So there's a lot of the psychological aspect people don't understand. Yeah. Anyways, um, I do want to add to that. I, I think that that's a very, very good point. How do you get consent in such a power imbalance between, as one person said, I don't remember who quoted this, but you have this Afghani jihadi and you have a 13-year-old Yazidi girl. Okay, where, how, how in hell does she say no? Yeah. There's no, it's not, and, and on top of it, there's no meaningful limitations put in the Quran and Sunnah to stop him. Mm -hmm. I always ask, I always ask this question. Why didn't Allah insist on marriage before sex with slaves? Because you can marry slaves. I mean, that's allowed in Islam. That's encouraged mm -hmm. you can marry slaves. But why didn't he insist on that? Why, can, why is it that you're allowed to to treat these people like property, to use them and then sell them. I mean, this is almost, it's not exactly prostitution, but it, it's similar in a way because you can buy her. So so we're gonna talk about, one of, the, one of the apologetics about Islam says that Islam limited slavery to only one source, which is captives of war. But once they're captives of war, you can buy and sell them. You can buy and sell them and they become like property. So once the slaves, the slaves, right? So I'm going to share the link if anyone wants to call in. Um, and let's, uh, while we're waiting for the calls, I'm going to show another clip by Mufti Abu Layth, which I thought was spot on. Okay, I'm going to mute you, Gondal. Now, I got into a discussion where people tried to say to me, that slavery inherently is not immoral. What the hell are they on about? How is slavery not immoral? Snatching somebody's wives and, and children and, and making them your property. That is utterly unacceptable. It is haram in our day and age. In our day and age. People will say, right, so, hmm. People will say, hmm, so what will you say about that day and age? We are talking about our day and age. It is now immoral. I'm not saying whether it was deemed immoral by them. Ethics vary. The ethics of age varies. So people today, we clearly see this as unethical. This is haram. It's not, some people commented on my thing saying, yeah, but Islam doesn't say slavery is necessary. So it's better not to do it. Better not to do it. What on earth are you on about? This isn't like saying, hey, do you want to eat a cheesecake? Hmm, you know, I don't know. It's not really too good for my diet. Like, I suppose it's better not to do it. What on earth are you on about? Are you, have you lost your mind? What do you mean it's not better not to do it? It's unacceptable. It's despicable. You can't snatch people's children under any circumstance so this is the argument given some circumstances you can snatch people's children and wives and turn them into your property no you can't under no circumstances can you do that 
and then somebody said, well, oh, I, I heard this lecture as well, and these guys are... <laughs> they said, oh, yeah, but we're not talking about, like, the U.S. Tra Atlantic trade, you know, the, the Atlantic trade slavery. We're talking about slavery like in Islam, where slaves had rights. <laughs> I said to them, my friend, kidnap and rape is still kidnap and rape, even if you're giving them three meals a day. It is still kidnap. It is still rape. It is still utterly unacceptable. It doesn't matter if you put them in a five-star hotel. If you've kidnapped them, you've kidnapped them. You know, if, you, if you're raping them, you're raping them. It doesn't, it doesn't make it okay because you're giving them food to eat. So this is the, the most absurd kind of logic. And then somebody said to me, oh, well, they're not really slaves. We don't call them slaves. <laughs> These were scholars arguing with me on a group. They said, oh, these are not, we're like, Islam says you're like the caretaker. <laughs> I said, are you, are you for real caretaker? Don't beat around the bush. Everybody knows what bloody slavery is. Don't try to, don't try to kind of like give it this veneer of caretaker. If somebody snatches your kids, right, and calls themselves I'm a caretaker, what do you mean caretaker? So you can't, this is nonsense, this is absurd. Don't, don't try to lie and twist your words to make, to beautify this kind of ugly brutality in this day and age. It is haram. Oh, wow, eh? Uh, quite uh, I, that sums up my position, honestly. Uh, <laughs> salute to Mufti Abu Lais, my man. Uh, I feel like he's one of the most uh, important, refreshing people out there. And he's a very, he's actually, for those who don't know, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. This guy is deeply trained in Islamic philosophy. He's a Mufti with a decade of worth more training from all across the Muslim world, from Pakistan to the Middle East, and he lives in the UK. So he's seen it all. He knows it, and if he's telling you this, it sums up my position. At the same time, I don't know, like, if I should laugh, but at the same time, I'm so sad because, like, he's pointing out the absurdity of the, the reasoning people employ to justify it is 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 just despicable, right? And it angers me at times. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll let Samir talk because I after hearing Mufti Bulais, it kind of got me a little riled up. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add. I just think that this is amazing. What he's saying is exactly on point. And honestly, Jonathan Brown kind of mirrored that sentiment as well. That, But he also got into this because I feel like there's no way to, to really justify something as bad as this. Um, we do have a caller. We have Sharik. So should I take him? Do you want to add any comments or should we just? Oh, then? no. Yeah, okay. let's, let's take Sharik. Hey, those of you who are here, I had a hard time uh, sending the link, but I put it in the description. So you can click the description uh, to to um, if you want to call in and um, you just need a you just need a website. Uh, sorry, you just need a webcam or even a microphone and just go to the link and we will add you to the call. Uh, hello, Sharik. How's it going? Hi, guys. How are you? Hey. Good, Finally, good. do this at a time that I can uh, <laughs> go in this. <laughs> I'm speaking Absolutely. on behalf of everyone um, in in the UK and Europe, so and, <laughs> and Africa, I guess. Um, so the time works. This is great. Great to be on here. Yeah, uh, thank I have you. a very I have a very quick question, but before I get to that question, I just want to say that Mufti Abulet is just awesome. I mean, I, I love sure. him. I, I love his. I like his clarity. Uh, and, uh, yes, he is a believer, and uh, obviously that's 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 his call, but. Uh, and he's, he's full of joy, which is also refreshing from a mufti. I mean, I like a yeah. smiling mufti. I, I don't think there are that many out there. Um, usually they're smiling or you're going to burn. That's when they start smiling. <laughs> um, and um, w one one thing just to add quickly, this is this is more of a comment. I'll get to my question very quickly. Um, you know, people who say that slavery was okay back then, well, if it was, then why would freeing slaves be encouraged? Obviously, it was bad even back then. Uh, how bad, there's a question mark on how bad it was or how bad it was considered back then, but uh, obviously, it was still not ideal. 
So that's a good point. Either, either, it's, either it's good or bad. I mean, it, yeah. So it got me a little bit. Be, of... uh, it would be a sin to free slaves if slavery is exactly. so good. If it's so good, if you were a caretaker, then um, then then you'd get you know so wild for that. You wouldn't keep uh, you wouldn't be encouraged to yeah. keep, yeah, keep caretaking. Yeah, yeah, yes. And the slaves there, if they're so loving this. They'll yeah. like want us be, be slaves. Yeah, why aren't there more slaves? <laughs> why aren't there more slaves? Why was it so hard to get slaves? Right. So, uh, so that's that's kind of my take. And that was more of a comment. Now, my question is, um, you guys are more knowledgeable than me about all these things. Um, um, now, we're talking about consent. Can slaves consent to sex? And and also, uh, Dr. Shavir Ali brought up wives consenting, etc. Now, my question is: Is does Islam even even understand sexual consent, marital consent? Yes, um, you know, you need the nikah and all. But even that can get a bit dodgy. But you know, at least let let's accept that marital marital consent is a concept well understood in Islam. One thing that I've never been able to get a clear understanding of is does Islam even understand sexual consent uh, consent in, in any situation, whether it's rape or uh, by force. That's why that's probably why rape gets confused by confused with adultery and fornication when it comes to prosecuting that under Sharia law, wherever it applies. Uh, but what, even in a marriage, a woman is always supposed to be available, can't really say no, or is actively discouraged from saying no. Um, um, and then you know, angels are going to curse her to the morning, uh, something like that. And uh, so it doesn't, if it doesn't arise for wives, it doesn't arise for slaves, and it doesn't arrive in forceful intercourse, then does, is, is that the glaring issue there, that um, Islam doesn't understand sexual consent? But that's, that's all I wanted to ask. I, um, I'll go first. Um, I, I, so I don't, okay. So definitely I think the idea of consent didn't exist back then because it's just not discussed in the Quran, it's not discussed in the Hadith in general, sexual consent. If you go even back as far as the Bible, you know, it talks about, you know, a man that rapes a woman, he has to pay some money to the father. It's kind of like he harmed, you know, he's harmed his property. property. And as a, as a panel, he has to pay back money for that. And then he has to marry her. So that I think it's in Levit Leviticus. I, I don't have the reference on hand. Um, but what I wanted to say is I don't I could be wrong on this, but I don't think Islam allows marital rape because the whole hadith about the, she will be cursed until morning if she doesn't you know give in to his sexual demands, it shows that she can actually deny him, right? So my understanding is that Shabir Ali was kind of implied she, he can do whatever he wants with her. He was implying the opposite. Um, I think the whole the whole concept of consent is just missing altogether because you know the relationship uh, the the marital relationship is considered one where his sexual demands uh his his sexual needs are foremost and for her what's foremost is that he is he provides for her and you know he gives her the maha which basically unlocks you know sexual access to her so I don't think Islam allows marital rape as far as I no, I don't think it does because it seems to me that I don't know what would happen if it happened. Like, would he be punished? Is there a punishment for that? I don't even know. I don't. I'm, it's, well, that's where that's where my question arises from. So, if something mm -hmm. is not allowed, then there would be some consequences for it. There, I don't know of anything that says, uh, "Well, she would be cursed until dawn if she doesn't give allow access." Firstly, the whole concept of purchasing access is. I mean, let's just. Ignore that for a second, but uh, which is what meher is. I mean, frankly, yeah. that's it, it's it's literally that. It, it's like a uh, price for a vagina. Just I'm putting it bluntly. Uh, but uh, if if it was Good wrong, point. if marital yeah. if marital rape was wrong, then there would be consequences, or it would be mentioned as wrong. So on using the the reasoning that unless it is prohibited, it is halal. Then therefore, I would argue that it is allowed because I don't know of any situations where it's been uh, prosecuted but well, yeah. underline under i don't know of hence my question <laughs> hmm. so for uh, for my take on a sexual consent i feel that there is a somewhat of a very skewed idea of consent that is in its infancy stages present in the islamic literature because we do see this uh, imam shafi say that uh, forcing yourself upon your wife at times would be considered rape and we do see mm -hmm. hadith where slaves uh, 
uh, ended up raping other slaves and they got punished for it. Actually, uh -huh. I have one on my thing. I'll quickly share this just so we're fair and, you know, we represent both sides. Uh, so if you can see here, Imam Malik Muatta says that there was a slave in charge of the slaves and he forced a slave girl among those slaves against her will and had intercourse with her. Uh -huh. Umar bin Khattab flogged and banished him, but did not flog slave girl because the slave had forced her, right? Uh -huh. There are other uh, instances like this uh, where you will see slaves being raped by other slaves or slaves being raped by non-master free men. But isn't that, isn't that again, harming someone else's property issue? Exactly. Mm. That's what it gets back to, right? So the point is, is you're not necessarily, like you said, punishing them for the rape. It could be just a property thing. Um, also, you can only get the non-consensual thing between the master the owner of that said slave he has mm -hmm. right to access her whenever but if any other person tries to then it's still considered rape right now mm -hmm. one thing shabira ali actually mentioned his actual video is 11 minutes in left and he mentions that even in the light of the broader context of free women at the time uh he mentions that men are called uh, the lord of the women and also uh one thing he brings up is women in the last sermon of the prophet were referred to with the terminology of unwanun, which either means cows or animals with you or like slaves with you. So, and he mm -hmm. said that Allah has given men power over women in that sense. So mm -hmm. he was using that as an excuse too, that yeah, they're, they have some consent, but like Samir said, they can still refuse and get the curse of Allah. Mm -hmm. But like, it's a very, it's a spiritual compulsion. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. That's so spiritual. that's one. That's my take on it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Marital rape, like you said, the four witness rule is very important. Where if a woman alleges she's raped and she can't mm -hmm. produce four witnesses, then she's admitting that she committed zina and she can get stoned, which has mm -hmm. happened in exactly, yeah. Muslim countries. So there's, it's a very weird, and you can see why this is a patently seventh century conception. Exactly. It's so that's exactly my cool. point. Yeah. So that's where. So. Where that leads us to is uh, you have to understand the context. And, yeah. and that's what and anyone listening to this, I would invite them to think about that, that if that was only valid in that context, then do we therefore reject it entirely now? Mm -hmm. And or, or do, does it need to be rethought entirely? And then where does this leave us with absolutely everything else in Islam? For me personally, j just this fact alone that this is not clearly understood is enough for a woman, uh, for any conscientious human being, but especially for a, for a woman to say, well, this alone is sufficient reason for me to reject all of this until this stuff is sorted out. I, I, it, it just is fundamentally immoral. So mm -hmm. my, my yeah. overall message is that this should lead us to question context and what are the implications on this if everything is contextual if everything needs to be rethought then everything needs to be rethought or rejected so yeah. that's it Absolutely. nothing else to add thank you Shaikh. thanks thank guys you so much for joining thanks, thank you so i i have a, um, a response that uh, i'm going to show here that just says that um there is an example of being punished for rape but it, it's worded in such a strange way. This is in Jamia Tirmidhi. It's a Hassan Hadith. It's not even a Sahih Hadith. But anyways, there was a woman that screamed. So her screaming is evidence that she was raped. And because she screamed, she wasn't punished for adultery. And the funny thing is, Prophet Muhammad said, Go for Allah has forgiven you. What the, what the hell was she forgiven for? She was raped. Like, <laughs> yeah. how are you blaming her for this? Like, mm. okay, you didn't stone her to death because she didn't want part of it. But like, it's such an odd statement. So, but again, this is not, this is not the example. This is an example of a, a, a free woman, not a slave and not, uh, you know, this is just a regular example of rape. So there is, rape can be, can be handled in Islamic law without four witnesses, but you know, not necessarily the, the case. Uh, so we have a couple other guests. I'm going to, uh, we have AX, uh, AX, hello. Hello. Oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, not too bad, thanks. All right. Uh, can you introduce yourself and uh, ask a question or comment that you have? Yeah, sh um, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, the last couple of weeks of uh, what's been uh, discussed in terms of narration and preservation. Um, 
learned a lot through a lot of the discussions on par. It's interesting how, um, just as just a statement, it's interesting how when you're talking to a lot of um, uh, people trained in the uh, the, the religious um, kind of uh, trend, you get the assumption that if you really want to learn about Islam, you probably shouldn't be doing a course that is taught by non-Muslims. Um, and yet, at this point, when you're looking for clarification, it seems that the arbiter that we want to, both sides, prefer to have is somebody who doesn't actually have a stake in the game that is not actually uh, a Muslim. Um, and I understand why that's the case. So um, that's one thing <laughs> that we want to probably have more of. Um, the other is uh, in the clip that you mentioned with uh, Dr. Ali, he does mention uh, something about a, uh, a Muslim if he can't afford a free uh, believing woman um, to to marry, then he is permitted to marry a slave who is a believer. Um, I'm just a little bit confused about how that would play out. So how in the world would you have a slave, even back then, who happened to be a believer? Did she convert after becoming a slave? Or can you actually enslave people who are believers? Can I uh, add? Good that? question. Uh, the, I feel that you can have slaves that are Muslim because there are. Uh, so hadith. hold on. There's um. There's actually uh, we do actually address that later on. Uh, yeah. Donald, but but basically no, you're not allowed to enslave Muslims, but you are allowed to keep the slave if they convert to Islam. You cannot enslave them. Okay. So let's let's again. This is the weird thing about Islam. Islam doesn't allow you to kidnap people and make them slaves, like the story of Joseph or the story mm. of Yusuf. They they found him in the well and, they, and he became a slave. You're not allowed to do that in Islam. Okay, yay, Islam! You can't kidnap people. <laughs> Wonderful human rights for the 21st century. But you can also capture them from war and sell them. So if you capture them from war and they're not Muslim, you can enslave them. I don't know what happens if you're fighting against Muslims, but you're not supposed to fight against Muslims anyways. But let's say you fight against non-Muslims. If it's a deviant sect, though. <laughs> <laughs> then they're not Muslim anyways, right? Because only our sect is proper. So anyways, you capture the slave. Uh, sorry, you capture them, you make them slaves, and then they convert to Islam. We'll, we'll show a reference later on that, that basically says they they don't get to <clears throat> they don't get to be freed because um, let's let's just show the slides because I uh, think this I is just want to add one point is uh, I heard a sheikh too, which was this whole thing about having like enslaving a non-Muslim, but then telling them, hey, if you become Muslim, you can be freed. If really? you become Muslim, I'll marry you and I'll elevate your status from a slave woman to my wife. A sheikh said that these are all tools that uh, are employed as a psychological uh, coercion or some source to push people, prisoners of war, to become Muslims, i.e. Islam grows like that. So it's, it's, it's it fits in the greater scope of things. That's my take on it. Okay, so yeah, I'm not totally sure. I think it, there's a lot here to unpack. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of different scenarios, but I'm just going to quote this Islam QA reference that says that Islam limited the sources of slavery. So basically what we've been saying all along, right? Sheikh al-Shankiti said the real reason for slavery is kufr and fighting against Allah and his messenger when Allah enables the Muslim mujahideen were offering their souls, blah, 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 blah. Basically the reward they get is one of the halal sources is slave is you know capturing slaves it also says on the next it also says later on in the same link that if the slave becomes muslim then what happens it says well no because the slave became muslim and you had the right to own a slave and he became muslim so you basically okay this is this is one opinion i don't know if there's there's probably different opinions or whatever but in this one opinion specifically says that um you would they would stay as slaves even if they converted to islam so mm. now the whole thing about marrying a slave again this is getting very complicated i don't know all the details but i'm guessing if you had a slave you could marry her and she becomes a wife she's no longer a slave there's also um walad which is when you impregnate a slave and um, should we talk about that now or should we go to the other questions? Uh, uh, AX, do you have any follow up to that? Is that kind of answer? To add to it, what I meant about psychological coercion is like, as soon as you enslave him, Muhammad employed this technique by himself, like in the cases of Safiya or Rayhana, he said, I can free you and you become my wife or you remain a slave 
by this with this guy the Akalbi or just remain a concubine so these uh, psychological tactics were employed by Muhammad himself uh, but again that's my last two cents but yeah we should uh, we should move on okay uh, does that answer your question yes yeah. it it certainly does um just one other follow-up if uh, i'm not sure if you guys are going to probably address this later on but the case of uh, i think it was uh, Mar maria Al oh yeah who uh, actually gave birth to a son by muhammad if i'm not correct um not really entirely sure but uh, from what i remember something along the lines that she did not convert until the birth or she did not wasn't freed until the birth of the son, which means that the relations that she had with the prophet was um, nine months prior while she was still a slave. So some clarification. Yeah, so we will address this whole thing uh, in a later part where we have a slide dedicated to it. This is a whole scandal around Muhammad and his sex slave Maria. And two of his wives were unhappy and they alleged that Muhammad is doing this. Uh, it's a whole uh, scandal that happened and Muhammad used Allah to shut his wives up and then Allah said you can keep on having sex with these slaves because Allah allowed you to. Uh, we will get to that at the end and uh, it is quite troubling to see that. Um, but what we will do is we will move on to uh, the next slide and uh, see what else we can find. But thank you a lot uh, for joining in and calling us. It was a great pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. Guys. Keep up the good work. Cheers. Thank you. All right. So let's see. Uh, where are we? Now, a lot of the times what happens is uh, I'm just going to share my screen and get back to the presentation. Okay. So I'm going to go back up so we get the point where we were okay so we did talk about limiting the sources of slavery and this slide is done as well now does islam uh, encourage freeing of slaves uh yes it does at times and that is definitely true where we do see that uh in fact another place in the quran too like i said with shabi ali saying that uh marrying the slave if she becomes a believer so she'll be freed as well and this is just uh this doesn't negate the fact that uh, slavery, just because Muhammad encouraged freeing slaves at certain times, that uh, it nullifies all the evils or all the other aspects of slavery that were committed by this. And there we will see examples, there were instances where Muhammad would actually uh, cancel a manumission and keep people in slavery, or sometimes he would trade let's say one slave for two or one slave for seven slaves. Point being that the <clears throat> that if he's just freeing slaves, he's still also introducing and doing uh, other bad things where he's introducing seven more people or two more people into slavery. So at the same time, yes, Muslims do say that we should uh, encourage uh, freeing slaves. Yeah. But not always. We're going to talk about that near yeah. the end. Near the end. Uh, thank you for your call. Um, AX or AX. Um, for the next uh, next person, Weeping Prophet. Hello, can you introduce yourself and ask your question? Hello, can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Hi, good morning. Uh, I am an atheist from India. So I've been studying psychology of historical events. So regarding this topic, I have a three part question relating to slavery itself. So uh, the first thing is, identity crisis making muslims want to associate with the victors who they were at the end of 21st century that's the first thing and the second thing identity crisis associating with losers they don't want to get associated with losers even though they are racially and ethnically they belong to that category and the third thing a political system which gives them an upper hand in every sphere of life at the detriment of human scientific progress and human rights they get everything because they have these uh, hedonistic benefits in that. So why should they leave Islam? Like, how do you convince them when they when they have the upper hand in every sphere of life? Thank you. Hmm. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So I think one of the things he mentions is the identity crisis that is uh, commonly seen today in Muslims with the colonialism and it's an inferiority complex. I believe he was alluding to where uh, 
post-colonialism and world wars and everything, the Muslim empire was broken up, uh, the Muslim states were dissolved, the Caliphate was dissolved. And since then, the Muslim world has been, let's say, uh, kind of almost trying to chase the Western world. So a lot of times, uh, these inferiority complexes and things come up in the, in the minds of Muslims, and that's why they want to appeal to, uh, let's say, the West and their academic excellence or the science and stuff. And hence, you see that Muslims will then come back to claim that, oh, science was already in the Quran or these moral values were in the Quran. Muhammad was a champion of feminism or the prince of peace and stuff like that. Um, I don't understand your question regarding the losers, but I would would assume it was along the lines that I mean, uh, they want to associate themselves with suppose uh, the murderous sultans of the past, conquerors and everything, but they don't uh, want to get associated with the conquered people who are like liberal like and scientifically progressed. So every time they look at the past, they associate themselves with murderers. Yeah, and yeah, let yeah. With, uh, these enlightened people. So uh, I think you're referring to like the jihad con, like uh, Ghazis and his, yes, exactly. Uh, okay, 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 yeah. Murderers, yeah. Like uh, in uh, that uh, movie, what's that? Uh, uh, Ranveer Singh's new movie in that song, Kali Bali. Yeah. Yeah, Alauddin Khilji. Uh, yeah, exactly. So Alauddin Khilji and a lot of these uh, these type of characters. So I get what you're saying because, but just taking the subcontinent's history of Islamic uh, conquests and empires, uh, there has been a lot of time. Mean, Muslims actually ruled a Hindu majority population for a huge while the Mughal Empire, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. Like it could be that they don't want to get associated with the uh, with the history and the violent history of the past with some Muslim conquest that had. Um, the third part of the question, I believe, was referencing that if they have a caliphate and have everything they want, how would you give offer them hedonistic ideas to get them out of Islam? Could you clarify the hedonism, that? The hedonism is already present in the in the Sharia. When Muslims are getting benefits through Sharia, like okay. women, property and everything, how do you convince them to leave it? Like, Ooh, okay, so that, that's that question comes from a uh, point of reference, right? Like, if you, I feel like Islam doesn't give into hedonism because it's also a relativistic claim. Like back in the day, the let's say the the, the liberties given to you by Islam might have been more so uh, than maybe available in other parts of society. But nowadays, if you were to say, oh, Islam actually gives people lots of happiness and hedonistic values, I would very much argue against it and say that no, the 21st century our society is has progressed so much that Islam actually limits people's freedom in fact of uh, giving them the freedom. But I do see your point that if there is a Muslim who believes fully that the caliphate is real and if he actually is living in an ideal Islamic state, then Muslims will get that sense of power and control. And if they have their way, then it makes sense. Like, yeah. They don't. It doesn't make sense for them to leave their religion if they're running a, an Islamic state. Yeah, and apparently, even in Islamic history, a lot of people converted to Islam to avoid paying jizya because a jizya is a humiliating tax that's put on non-Muslims. So, if you become Muslim, I mean, you don't have to pay that tax anymore, right? So, it it became a source of conversion as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your comment. We're we're gonna keep well, keep it moving. So, right. thank you so much uh, for that. And we're just gonna go to the next one. Uh, hello, we have a theist. Uh, hello, th atheist. Atheist? Are you atheist or are you atheist? Uh, no, no, I am. Uh, I'm a bit of confused right now. How are you? Okay. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm calling from Pakistan, and hey. uh, yes, and I would like to say uh, I'm a big fan of yours, both of you. Thank and, you. And uh, yes. Uh, so uh, my question was actually uh, being a Muslim when I used to recite Quran, right? Uh, like I always ask myself this question: Why at that time? I did not question, like these kind of questions did not came into my mind that slavery, like I was even reading the, uh, you can say, um, uh, I was reading tafsirs from Mulana Modudi and everything, right? But these questions like slavery was permitted at that time, right? They never came into my mind. I don't know why. Even okay. when I started listening to you people or other mm -hmm. people, only then I started like realizing it and then I started studying about it. But why not when I was just reading it uh, as a Muslim? 
my take is that you these things are not presented to you you know they're not really talked about and mm -hmm. And in some ways, uh, the sort of irrelevant to modern Muslims, right? I mean, slavery is not happening anymore, so why would why would it even come up, right? The issue comes about when someone is looking again, going back to Muhammad as a perfect man. Then you start to see inconsistencies um, when they're highlighted to you. So a lot of times, I mean, me and Gondal were talking about. Sometimes as a non-Muslim, now you read a verse of the Quran and you're like, I can't believe I didn't notice how bad this was. Yeah. Because you you have a you have a t uh, faith tinted glasses on. Yeah, um, I would just quickly add to it, like as like you said, the lens of the believer. Now, for myself, because I'm from Pakistan, like the caller here, um, and he can relate to that. Uh, Muslim majority countries in a country like Pakistan is such a monolith where it's like ninety eight ninety seven percent Muslim you were intellectually isolated that you're never exposed to um, a different perspective. And what happened with me was when I came to Canada, I was exposed to so many different ideas. And eventually I realized that I need to stop looking at the Quran from a lens of a believer and maybe put on, like Samir said, the uh, lens of rationality and analysis and then look at it. And as soon as the perspective changed, the whole thing crumbled. And that was very important, that uh, changing of perspective and being able to view something that you hold very sacred to yourself, it takes a lot. But if you can view it from a different perspective, I think that's all it takes to uh, pull the open the box of Islam and it's all over. Thanks for your call, Atheist. Uh, we have another call in line, so I'll have to leave it at that. And... Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we have Zubair. Zubair, hi. How's it going? Uh, hi, Zubair. Yes, we've been seeing, I've seen yeah. you in the comments a lot and your your long, critical comments you've been putting on uh, my YouTube channel. <laughs> I saw can you those. hear me first? Yeah. Was, can you yeah. hear me first? Yeah. Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I can hear you. Uh, would you like okay, to hear my, my, my line is not very good, but inshallah, I will try inshallah. Okay, okay. Okay, go, first, go what, I, what I wanted to what I wanted to say is uh, first of all, I'm not very fluent in English, but I will try to make my point. Okay. 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 Well, first of all, the 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 the, the Islamic scholars have spoken about uh, this issue of uh, raping uh, slave women and taking them as a uh, sex slave. Uh, the and 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 all this. You understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. Go on. Okay, in the book of uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Qudama, in his book Al Mughni, it on. is written that uh, the ulama, the, especially the, the early ulama, the early scholars of Islam, and especially the big the scholars of the former Dahib, they have nearly a consensus that a woman, a captive woman, who is not a Muslim, the Muslims were not allowed to have intercourse with them unless they became Muslim. This is in Al Mughni. He talks about it. But the, the hadith, the hadith okay. in, says that the, they wanted to sleep with the Arab captives of war who were not Muslim. And they and didn't okay, the hadith, he, he, no, he talks about the hadith. He said this hadith exists, but the ulama has, has gone against this hadith. You and understand? The prophet? And they oh, against the no, no, they didn't, get, okay. they didn't go against the prophet. They have they interpreted okay. this hadith. You understand? Okay. So they said that this hadith, because these people, uh, it, it was talking about the battle of Autas. These people were, were, were polytheists, they were pagan, you understand? So they said it, it was nearly ijma of the ulama that a pagan woman, a Muslim cannot sleep or cannot have intercourse with a captive okay. who, were, who, who, who is a pagan, you understand? That, that seems to go against what... Against a lot of references. I yeah. would disagree because a lot of references and a lot of ahadith tell us that Muslim... No, listen. But, but you know, listen, even, there, even I have a reference... The scholars, like, yeah, the scholars, know. they knew these ahadith, you understand? Yes. And uh, the question I wanted to ask you, I wanted to you guys to bring me only one reference that say that either the Prophet or the Muslim slept with the slave girls uh, who were non-Muslims? I wanted that I, reference from I you. I have one right in front. Right of on the 
I don't know if you can that were non Muslims. Yeah, that's yeah, what it says. And because you can't take Muslim women as captives, right? <laughs> it says right here that the companions of Muhammad felt guilty, were reluctant to have relations with the female captives because of the pagan husbands. We're talking about these were married women they captured. Now, one thing to point out is there was a verse revealed about this, and that's what I need to get to, it's 424. It says, all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives who your right hand possesses. And this verse was sent down specifically to tell the Muslims that you can continue having sexual intercourse despite these women being married off and their husbands still being alive. So if listen, Allah is saying listen, that... Listen, this is your interpretation. The scholars, they know this verse and they know this uh, hadith, but they said that the, the woman, if she's pagan, she needs, she has to, to embrace Islam first. You understand? Uh, you know the wife of the prophet, Juwiriya, she was a pagan. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you yeah, hear me? She stayed a yeah, pagan. Ahead, ahead. No, 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 no. Here's the she thing. was a pagan. She, she, was, she was taken uh, captive, you know? <clears throat> yeah, keep, and then the, she went... keep that with you. I'll show you something. Okay. Okay. I'm going to share. I want you screen. to bring. Sure, he's going to bring something, yeah. Okay. And uh, Zubair, I do appreciate you calling in. Uh, honestly, it's very, it takes no a lot problem. of time. No problem. Okay. Here you have two atheists and, um, you know... No problem. It's my pleasure because uh, this is an important issue. Yes. Okay, yes. so here we are looking at Tabari. I think it's... No uh, problem. Yeah. It's talking about... Uh, oh. Rehana, right? Yeah. A woman okay. from Banu Amir. And okay. she remained his concubine when he predeceased her. So it's saying that the Prophet uh, offered to marry her and opposed the curtain on her. But she said... Rather leave me in your possession as a concubine, for it is easier for me and for you. So he did so. When the messenger of God okay, took what, her captive, what what are you quoting? Well, I'm trying to say that this lady was a concubine of Muhammad, Muhammad, but not a Muslim, and he still has which lady? Rehana. Which lady? Rehana. No, I'm not Rayhana. talking about Rehana. I'm talking about Juwairiya. No, but I'm just giving you an example. That it clearly says that no, Rehana. First of all, you have to bring me, you have to bring me uh, an authentic hadith that say that Rehana was uh, uh, from uh, the the Prophet's slaves. Authentic. Okay, here's have? another one. Let me give you one. Uh, buying and wait. Uh, so here's another one, okay? Ali, the yeah. prof, uh, the tell me, prophet, tell me first, yeah. tell me first about the hadith and the authenticity of it. Yeah, it's Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih. So it says that Ali uh, okay. went to the booty and he had sexual act with a slave girl, and one of the Sahabis complained, and the prophet said, "Do you hate Ali?" And he says, "Yes." And the prophet replied, "He deserves even more than that from the Qumlis. So he had sex with a slave girl. That was. Uh, it appears non-Muslim because she's still part of the war booty or was captured. No, no, you can't. You can't. You can't know she wasn't Muslim. Yeah, let me find the reference from Muhammad uh, ha having. Uh... Obviously, she's not Muslim. What, what, what battles was Ali in? Was what, what would the Prophet be sending him to attack Muslims? Like the Prophet didn't send Ali to kill Muslims. Obviously, these are no, not Muslims. No, listen. When, when, when uh, women were taken captives. They have to give the to give them a da'wah. Some of them uh, became Muslim, and these ones who became Muslim okay, because so, they were captives. So what what does what does it change if she had to be Muslim? Okay, how does that how does that yeah. improve the situation of sex slavery? Okay, okay, here's you know, another hadith. Were Muslims? No, listen, this is not sex slavery. You know, because I'll tell you something. You were talking about uh, consent or non-consent. When uh, we were talking, we are talking about Arabs, Bacons. You understand? <sighs> Okay. Okay. So uh, when a I woman think, is a, is a we'll pagan, this. can I yeah. finish? Can I finish? Okay. Okay. Your last point, and then can we'll I finish? Other calls. Thank you. Mufassal. Can way. I finish? Yes. Make your last point. Can I finish, please? Yes. 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 When a, when a woman is a pagan, then she 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 she's a bit uh, in uh, uh, among the captives. A Muslim 
cannot have sex or intercourse with her while she is a pagan. I told you the ulama, most of the okay. the majority of the ulama have this opinion. Okay. Okay. Now, if she becomes Muslim you your, by her own choice, yeah. that means she took the decision. Let, let me finish. Let me yeah. finish, please. If she become Muslim, that means she took the decision to separate herself from her, hus her husband if she was married before. Yeah. You understand? This goes against so all because of, of Islam, all the evidence you know. yeah. because of her becoming Muslim, her marriage, herself, herself, she has uh, cancelled the marriage with her husband, her former husband. Okay. So Thank this is a consent. She Thank knows you. she's a slave. She knows she's a captive. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your uh, your opinion and your points. As Thank much you so much. Ruben. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Let's take next call. Okay, and the next call is Mufassil Islam. Uh, Mufassil. Hey, Mufassil, my man, how's it going? <laughs> it's so nice to see you. I haven't <laughs> talked to you before, but uh, salam, peace, uh, salam and lots of love. From your friendly neighborhood, Mufassil Islam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, how are you guys doing, guys? You're all right? Great, great. It's nice to see you, man. It's great all that right. you joined in, actually. All right, thank you very much for having me. Uh, the topic is slavery. I, well, uh, well, I probably missed the uh, first half of the program. I'm just trying to pinpoint your definition of slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we actually, how, how do you how define We slavery? actually went by the definition by uh, Yes, I missed Brown. it. If you, if, you, if, you, if you could short in, in brief, you know, tell me. Yeah. What, uh, what is your definition of slavery? We'll do. Uh, we'll follow the slide by Samir. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Let me add it. Yeah. Yeah, slavery is best understood as an involuntary relationship of mutual dependence between two quite unequal partners. I mean, that's one way to define it. It's something when you see it, you know it. But but what's what's your point exactly? Or what what do you? Well, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to find out whether uh, slavery, from your point of view, really exists in Islam. And to okay. know that, first of all, first of all, I need to know what your definition of slavery is. And secondly, I would need to know what are your uh, platforms for saying. This is for from Islam. What are your sources of depending that this is from Islam? It started with me, the Quran. Because Sunnah. you have been, uh, I mean, you have been. You have yeah, been I think you did miss the beginning, right? But yes, I, I do apologize started. for that. I, I do apologize. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I, what I have seen a lot of uh, referencing from Bukhari, right? And uh, I consider Bukhari 99% of them to be of, of oh, that bookery to okay. be okay we can just stick to quranic references I mean, have, yeah, i'm just yeah, making my yeah, point no here. problem there are, but there I just are many to... reasons i can give you a dozen of reasons for for you know there's no argument there from any of the sides will be able to disagree that bookery is more or less 99 percent uh not to be a, a, accepted in islam to ban sure. okay so... let's go go let's go for quran uh what okay, is the yeah. quran that you want to denote that to be slavery that's what i'm trying to figure out Okay, um, for example, 236, uh, those who guide, guard the private parts except for the wives or those who the right hands possess. Um, before, before you answer, before you jump in, I'm just going to say that we are presenting this from the Sunni doctrine perspective. We're not going by Quranism. We're not going by Quran only or uh, historical revisionism. We are going based on the... Sunnism or Shiaism. Sunni, yeah, but, Sunnism or Shiaism, you, you can you then you <clears> have <throat> to change your title to Sunni Islam or or something like that. Okay, but still, when you talk about, about Islam, when you say well, Islam, I have to know your basis of calling it Islam. So if you want to okay. base it on Quran, I have no problem with that. Just stick I'll, to Quran then. I'll give you the best reference where Allah tells Muhammad to take slaves from the captives directly from the Quran. Is that okay? Would that suffice? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just the problem is problem is I am uh, as you see I am out and about is drizzling a bit because no I'm problem. having an I'll awful connection on my internet today. You know. So uh, go ahead. Go ahead. So what I'll do is I'll share my screen and we'll be talking about the words 3350, and it's very clear in this message and this talks sorry, about you, you can, 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 can yeah. you can can you sorry uh, can can you quote the uh, yeah, I'm quoting. Yeah, so it's verse. Surah Ahzab, Surah number 33, verse number 50, and I'll read. Surah 33, yes. Yes, and it says, O Prophet, we have made lawful to you your wives uh, to whom you have given their due compensation and those your right hand possesses from what Allah has returned to you, that is captives. And then it goes on, the daughters and the people that, you know, he can't marry. And then he says, uh, with you and a believing woman, if she gives herself to the Prophet, 
excluding the other believers is a, a specific thing that's speci special to Muhammad. At the last part of the verse says, we certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them concerning their wives and those their right hand possesses in order that there will be upon you no discomfort. This verse is very yeah, yeah, yeah. explicit in saying that, yes, uh, having concubines is not only halal, but Allah tells him, do it. <clears throat> well, you see, when it comes to concubine and engaging um, the war captives into uh, sexual, um, what, whatever you want to call it, uh, prostitution or whatever, there are several verses that I, I can bounce that off. But the main problem is, uh, the terminology of slave, that's why I started with the word slave. Uh, in, in Quran, there are several words uh, which are used to somehow refer to some, some people who are not totally free. For example, there are um, almost 31, I mean, uh, verses which will directly or indirectly refer to people who are not totally free. <clears throat> I, can, I, can, I can give you a list of them, you know, you, you, can, you can check. But those words are, include, for example, Fatayitiyakum, uh, then Abdina, then Wal Abdu, Bil Abdi, Fatayitikumu, and I can I can go on naming uh, those words. For well, in, in that but, in that sense, nobody is but, free uh, because we're all Abdullah. No, I, I I I'm coming I'm coming to that. <laughs> now, when it comes to uh, Rakabatin and the and the exact use of the word slave, who denotes slave? Uh, in Islam, if you read Quran Surah 16, verse 75, that's what will someone be defining a slave because the word abd, directly or indirectly, whatever is referred to in the Quran, it is, uh, it is the word is slave for Allah because we are slaves only for Allah. You will never find uh, abd, the word abd used by any Muslim, even for name, for any other being except for Allah. So when it comes to slavery in Islam, it's Abdullah, not Allah. And I mean, we can, you can, we can laugh a while, but yeah. uh, in, in, in England, for, for example, UK, um, in 1833, the slavery was abolished. But technically, our forefathers, I mean, I understand um, you probably, at least two, a couple of you, I mean, to both of you and, I, and me included, we came from a region where slavery continued until 1919, where indentured laborers were, in fact, slaves, servants who are, in fact, slave, voluntary, volunteer uh, slaves though they are branded as, as, as servants. So if you want to call about what is, uh, Quran is denoting to say right and possess, they are the people who were captured uh, following the kitabis, uh, the people of the other, other books, and because they were, being they were being captured. So they were following uh, the Deuteronomy chapter, because if you believe uh, the, uh, the Kaibar incident, uh, and you also w want to go to the into the history. Okay, so I just of, want to interject uh, here a little bit, Mufassil, is that uh, just because you're referencing other people partaking in slavery and sex slavery does not make the slavery that happened. I haven't been able to. I haven't been able to. Uh, that the, the pr uh, Samir, you're muted as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead, Rondo. Go ahead. Just finish. Let what I'm trying to get to is if you keep referencing the slavery in the Bible or other people doing it, that's just what about re? That's not getting to the point. I'm yeah. still trying to see what the point is here, as uh, in regards to Abdullah. Yes. Yeah, so can I, we just I, I, just I finish it quickly finish because we want to? Yeah. So just one more minute, please. Okay. And I'll, I'll, be I'll be finishing it very quickly. Okay. Very very simple. The words right and possessed denotes to people who were captured at war and they were slowly freed. And that is clearly uh, mentioned in Surah 9, verse 60, how it is encouraged because Quran is a book of inspiration, how to free those people who are in captives because Muslims were under the obligation of following the book of the other people for their judgment until a certain period of time. So if you remember when the, when the Jewish people were captured, they were, the, the, if you know the judgment, how they were judged, they were asked and they, they opted for judgment to rely on someone who were their middleman. And they had, were followed, obliged yeah. to follow so, uh, so the been laws was, right? of the book of theirs, which is Bible and Hebrew Bible. And they were judged by Deuteronomy and they were enslaved under that. 
Uh, well, okay. I, I, I will just take you one more minute. Going on and on and on again. Yeah, so I, I, I'd say let's stop it here. History okay. of Dunuaz. Before that, the Christians did the same to the Jews. The Jews did the same to the Christians, and they were given an offer to be judged by their own book. That's how it is. Yeah. So the the point I'm trying to get to a lot of people back in in history thought racism was okay, slavery was okay, so therefore Islamic slavery is okay. You can't reference I'm somebody else's something. shortcoming. To make an argument and justify your own. That's not even an you're argument. Breaking up. I don't know. Uh, you're break, breaking up, man. Let me okay. walk out of, yeah, out thank of you. my home. Okay. Mufassal, thank you for I'm your call. Walk out of my home. Okay. okay. Thank you for your call, Mufassal, and uh, for trying to say everyone's a slave. And uh, in Deuteronomy, they also had slavery. I don't know. I don't see the point. I don't. Anyways, so the first call that we had was trying to say um, you have to be Muslim to be to have sex with your slaves or something. And the other one was saying everyone's a slave. Uh, but yeah, I apologize for cutting you off, but it's going, we do want to continue the slides now. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's get back to the slides because- They're very juicy. So we'll take calls in like the next five. Yeah, we'll yeah. take five. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> we, we said this, this one, this one, this one. Uh, we talked about this. Did we talk about this one? The, the jealous? Mm -hmm. No. So let's, let's do this. I did mention it briefly, but I'll go over it again. Uh, this just shows, this is a very interesting from Imam al Smata, one of the earliest collections of hadith, and is said, said to be the, one of the most soundest ones as well. Uh, <clears throat> so a man comes to uh, Omar bin Khattab and says, complains that uh, he used to have sex with his sex slave, but then his wife was mad and jealous of him having sex with his sex slave, so she suckled the girl, the sex slave, turning the, the girl into a mehram, and hence rendering the guy's... Uh, possibility of having sex with her as zina or incest. Uh, and so the guy is upset about this and he takes the matter to Omar, complaining about this white, his wife's steps. Omar says, go back to your slave and continue having sex with her and beat your wife. Uh, that is self-explanatory. It's, <laughs> it's bizarre. It's uh, like, the second uh, part uh, is from the Quran having uh, revealed five or ten cycles that can make uh, relationships like invalid you know like because it establishes kinship uh long story short yeah this is just one weird hadith which just shows how uh, bizarre this whole uh, it shows was. it shows how unhappy the wives were about oh, yeah. the sex living and it's not just this guy's wife muhammad's wife were unhappy as well right mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. okay. oh we already yeah. talked about this okay we talk about this or should i yeah, we went over this. Uh, no, we didn't. No, actually. Oh, we didn't actually. Uh, the law of Kisas. Now, this, yeah. is, this is very interesting. The law of Kisas is saying that um, basically, again, Allah is equating a slave for a slave, a free man for a free man. So if, if, if someone murders your slave, the, the retaliation would be an equivalent in slaves. Slaves are actually valued as less than free, free, free people. Uh, which is, again, very strange because a slave is a human being just like a non-slave. I don't totally understand the the um, the fiqh behind this, but it is right there in the Quran that slaves have a value less than free people when it comes to the law of qisas or the law of retribution or equality. Mm. Okay? Yeah. Uh, they talked about limiting sources of slavery. They talked yeah. about that. Yay, Islam only allows kid uh, no kidnapping, but it allows uh, prisoners of war. But once the prisoners of war... Uh, 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 slaves, you can sell them, buy them, trade them, yeah. buy two for one deals. We'll talk about that. Okay, let's talk about a little something a little bit positive, um, mm. sort of positive. The Quran, you know, encourages freeing the slave. It's considered a good deed. So right there, it's admitting that slavery is actually it's, a bad thing. Yeah, it, covertly, it's admitting that. Yeah, yeah. Because if it was a good thing, then why is there a point to like uh, free the slave at all? Like uh, Shari said earlier is if the slavery model in Islam is so good and so amazing and the caretaker system is so so uh, so productive, the slaves should just remain the slaves and be happy. The master <laughs> just keep giving them uh, care, right? Like, yeah. So uh, I guess that this, it becomes a circle, like, yeah. you know, uh, slavery is, 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 is immoral, so therefore free the slaves, but then don't free the slaves. <laughs> uh, can, you, can you explain this? Okay, so this one's very, very interesting. Uh, we were talking about this. So Muhammad had a concubine uh, whose name was Maria. And this hadith uh, talks about the, this whole scandal that happened where uh, 
Let's just read the hadith. That the messenger of Allah had a female slave with whom he had intercourse. But Aisha and Hafsa, his two wives, would not leave him alone until he said that she was forbidden <laughs> for him. They were not having it. They did not want Muhammad to have sex with the slave girl. Right? But then Allah revealed, the sublime Allah revealed, O oh, Prophet, why do you forbid yourself that which Allah has allowed you to do? I know. Yeah. Like, why are you trying to be a good person? Like, what the hell? Like, why are you why are you feeling guilty about having sex with these uh, captured women? There's nothing wrong with that. Listen to you. Allah, I'm, I'm, Allah, I'm gonna tell you, it's fine. It's fine. Just do and I it. don't and I don't care. It's like this guy Muhammad has like what eleven wives or thirteen wives, a bunch <laughs> of concubines, and he still wants more sex, man. Like, chill out, dude. Yeah. Yeah, we and you have a good explanation for that too from the neuroscience perspective of how it affects your sexual Yeah, hypo or hypersexual yeah. behaviors and epilepsy. Yeah. Yeah, 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 definitely. And we have actually classic examples from like Wayne Bent where he actually ended up uh uh exploiting minors and then also ended up marrying his adopted son's well, his son's wife, very similar to Muhammad Aish uh, marrying Aisha at a young age, and then also marrying his adopted son's wife. <laughs> Yeah, we we didn't bring this up earlier, but this was a really interesting co comment someone's making made in the made in the chat that like this is a very good hypothetical question. Mm -hmm. If you like slavery, just just put yourself in the slave shoes. What if some non-Muslims came? They captured your wife as a slave. They took your daughter and your son as slaves. Would you be okay with that? Even if it was Islamic slavery with yeah. the rules of Islam, would you be okay with this? Like. It's a good question. Put yourself in the shoes of the person that's captured, right? Like, it applies to like uh, other things too, right? Like apostasy. Well, if you're okay with the Muslims and Islam killing their apostates, well, why are you not okay with Christians or Jews killing their apostates, right? In theory, that you should be okay with them killing their apostates too, from stop them to converting to your religion. But like I said, as long as it favors you, it's all good. But it's not in your favor. Oh, it's immoral. <laughs> So uh, next, so yeah, uh, this also shows you the psychology of Muhammad that whenever he wanted something that he was being troubled by others, for example, marrying Zainab, for example, his wives are complaining about something. A worse will come in the Quran, yeah. Worse will come in the Quran and will give him exactly what he wants every time. Mm. The details of this scandal are so bad, I think Surah 66, the theme, and it, he goes to the point where he literally threatens the wives, Hafsa and Aisha, indirectly saying like, if you will go against, Allah will replace you, and all the believers and the angels and the and Allah is against you. So the psychological game it plays with the wives is they're not they have this illusion of yeah they can say no we want to leave you and stuff but can they really because the backlash and the psychological manipulation is intense. Mm -hmm. So and, next one. All right, this one's interesting where it says, Yahya said that Malik related, again from Imam Malik. Uh, so uh, Umar al-Khattab said, what's the matter with men who have intercourse with their slave girls and then dismiss them? Point is that he's admitting that there were lots of Muslim men who were just enslave him and just to have intercourse with them and then just sell them or just dismiss them or just leave. Like. Point is, it just reminds you that yes, sex slavery was a common thing. And it says here, no slave girl comes to me whose master confesses that he has had intercourse with her, but that I connect her child to him. Whether or not he has practiced coitus interruptus or stopped having intercourse with her. Uh, so he, I think he's saying that if a slave gets pregnant, the master is uh, denying it. Yeah. So yeah. It, it just goes back to the imbalance of power again. Exactly. You know, with a marriage contract, you, you're agreeing to marry this woman and you know take care of her children in in the west especially nowadays and maybe all over the world you are financially responsible as a father because you you made the baby and you're also you know responsible to care for the child's well-being and financial support and all that yeah it's just saying that the they wanted to have the cake and eat it too they're having slave girls but they're not willing to take responsibility for the babies that they're making mm -hmm. right yeah. and again is this good for society um you know that that muslim preacher yesterday was saying oh islam is good for society but is this good for society really no. creating a whole bunch of slaves that you can buy and sell and have babies with and then like even if it wasn't even if it doesn't happen today theoretically you can either come back or even if not if it doesn't come back the fact is this is all allowed as part of the religion it's not condemned right 
Yeah. And what's also what I want to make one point is the Islamic history is full of this, like from the Mughal empires to the Afghanis and then great Muslim scholars even had slaves from 15th, 16th century. They would have concubines and they would admit to it. So it's yeah. not that if this was only happening in the first part of Islam. It, this lasted for a while. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Brown admits that too in his book. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. Can you explain this? Okay, so what happens here, and this is one more example, is the Prophet sent Ali to Khalid uh, to bring the hummus of the booty. And uh, I hated Ali. So Buraida, this guy, the companion, hated Ali. And Ali had taken a bath after a sexual act with a slave girl from the hummus. So yes, Ali, the, the cousin of the Prophet and his son-in-law had sex with slave girls. And he was married to his daughter, by the way. He still allowed him to have sex with slave girls. So anyways, uh, I said to Khalid, don't you see this Ali? When we reached the Prophet, I mentioned that to him, i.e. that he had sex with the slave girl. And then the Prophet asked, oh, Buraida, do you hate Ali? And Buraida said, yes. And then the Prophet replied, do you hate him? For he deserves more <laughs> than that from the homo. So he deserves even more slave girls, more war booty, more captives. Yeah, Yikes. deserves. Yeah, he deserves that. Yeah, he's a good commander, I guess. So he gets yeah. lots of booty. I mean... It gives a new, <laughs> new meaning to the word booty. Eh? Okay. Yeah. This one was really hilarious. You found this. Can, can you want to read this? Yeah. So this was I was just going through his last minute find. Aisha had a male slave and a female slave who were married. So there's a slave couple that Aisha owns, and I want to free them both. It makes sense. Yeah, if they're both married, just let them off. Go free, they can enjoy their honeymoon. The messenger says, No, if you free them, start with the man first and then the woman. Like, why? Why did they're like that? It's like they're like a it's like the male slave have more value or takes precedence over female why, slaves. Why do you want to keep the female slave? Is this another form of patriarchy manifesting itself? Well, this, this female slaves have certain benefits that male slaves don't have, right? So, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, but... maybe because the guy is free, like he can. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so again, um, do you want to read these? Yeah, so a man manumitted a slave and he had no other property than that. So the Prophet canceled them. This is what's important. When Muslims say that the Prophet always encouraged uh, freeing slaves, here's an example where the guy was already given away to pay. The Prophet yeah. canceled the manumission, canceled freeing of the slave, okay, and resold him to pay off debt. Yeah, and there's, there's another examples like that too. Yeah, I, this is just one. There's a three, next four slide. where he says that yeah. don't free the slave, give it to my uncle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. next slide. We'll talk about yeah. that. One. But here's uh, an interesting one where the Safiya thing, where Muhammad first, uh, after the Khaybar, he killed her whole pride, burnt her, I think it was his uncle or dad, tortured on her chest by lighting a fire, whatnot. After all of that, he then gives Safiya away to this guy called Dia Kalbi by mistake. Then people thought, oh no, she's a daughter of the chief. She's too pretty. You can't give it to Dia Kalbi. So then Muhammad says, oh shit, calls Dia Kalbi back, then gives him seven slaves to get Safiya back. Point being, he's introducing seven people into slavery to get one girl that he likes. And what I want to understand, you don't understand that at this point, he at already has a bunch of wives and a bunch of it's like like why are you not satisfied why do you keep wanting more and more the yeah. point is like slavery and like trading seven for one again shows that slaves are a property a property and they have varying values depending either on their skin oh, color right. or their male or female and whatnot and this yeah. shows that this is just it's just despicable like mufti abulay said yeah uh, although I don't think Mufti Abu Layth was talking about Muhammad. He was, has to get out of condemning Muhammad, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Um, one, of the, one of the responses that people sometimes give is that, well, if a slave woman gets pregnant, she becomes a special type of slave, or she's sort of a, his wife. But she's not exactly his wife. She becomes an um walid. And it, wow. even, this, is, this is so damaging. So you just sell the slave that is the mother of your child? That is the crazy thing. That's ridiculous. It says we used to sell us slave women and the mothers of our children. Wow. And the prophet was still living amongst us and we did not see anything wrong with that. Wow. Baby so, so she's still a slave. 
Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> and if she, if you so the fiqh says that if she if you die before she dies, she's freed. That's in Sunni fiqh. Apparently in Shia fiqh, she's only freed if her child is still alive. And her value is then deducted from this child's share of inheritance. I don't know the details about Shia fiqh. I just read that online. It may or may not be true, but this is what it said. So for Sunni fiqh, wow. you there's a sort of small advantage you have if you get pregnant with your slave master. So, I mean, how how is anyone defending this? Like, it's a, it's a, there is no defense. I mean, if you there is no you can't defend this. Like, come on, if you want to think that in the 21st century you can try to make arguments for pro this stuff, I cannot help you any further. Like, how much like it's at this point like you have to like hold everybody's hand and drag him out of this because this shouldn't need explaining. This should be self-explanatory exploitation of vulnerable yes. people. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And I again, I'm just going to go back to the whole racism issue in Canada um, in America. It shows you that we've you know, the, the the fact that veganism is becoming more popular, the fact that we actually are angry about police brutality and about racism, our ethics are, are, have gone way past slavery, yet we still have people defending slavery because they're stuck. Like, it's like Shabir yeah. Ali. I, I like Shabir Ali. It just shows you that a good person like this is what religion does to good people. It can like rot the brain because what it does is it forces you into a position where you have to defend it. And Jonathan Brown, his whole book is defending. I mean, he he talks about how bad it was and he's not, he's not saying slavery is good. He says slavery is bad, but he has to sort of say, well, that was that time, you know, today it's bad. So he's basically taking sort of the Mufti Abu Layth approach of trajectory hermeneutics. It's not wanted to free slaves. Islam was making it, you know, the goal to free slaves, but was well, it? it? It comes back to the more relativism, right? And, and I don't buy the argument that Islam wanted to free slaves just a gradual. Man, you did a spontaneous, hardcore smackdown on so many other things in Arabian society. You could have easily ended slavery. And if you could end idolatry, yeah. usury, yeah. fornication. Yeah. Yeah, you can end this. And, and let's 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 talk a little bit. More. Like we gave examples where slavery was actually kept going like okay this is a good example like let's talk about this yeah so it says here that uh, a man among us promised freedom to a slave after his death and he did not have any property other than him so the guy who owned the slave has already promised that if i die you go free so the I prophet wonder, told what him beautiful, what a beautiful thing to say yeah hey, it's a nice noble thing yeah you're oh, my slave i'm gonna die soon you took good care of me i'm gonna free you now, let's but see the what prophet happens. didn't free him he sold him to another guy to pay off that again. Another hadith, it says the slave died the same year. Wow. Oh, wow. His yeah. last year year of life, he would have had a year of life as a free man. It was taken away from him because of Muhammad. Wow. The next one says, a man had six slaves and he did not have any other wealth apart from them. And he set them free when he died. The messenger fellow divided them into groups, set two free and left four as slaves. Gosh, dude, this guy is bad. Like, I'm seriously getting pissed reading this stuff. Like, I'm getting pissed too. I'm like, getting pissed. Like, <laughs> like, okay, you want to free slaves, and like, I want to swear that now. Like, free them. Why are you doing this? Like, yeah, I know the Islamic thinking. Can you give a fault. Let's imagine the psychological backdrop of this. These slaves are told that yes, we are free. They're expecting. They're happy. Yes, you've got our freedom. Oh no. Imagine the psychological turmoil they go through. It's so terrible. It is, All right, let's go yeah. before we start swearing at this. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the the reasoning for this, just to kind of explain it, is Muhammad was trying to say that you know take care of your family, meaning he was he was preferring the Muslims over the slaves. He was saying, well, you guys shouldn't give away all your slaves. Keep some slaves for yourself, or you know keep them as get the money for the slave rather than you know. Now this is a this is another moral yeah. justification against um, slaves running away. There's and the one thing I want to know that this is just one hadith. There's a plethora of hadith about slaves running away. And then, uh, anyways, to sh simplify it, if a slave runs away, no salah will be accepted from him, and if he dies, he will be a disbeliever. A slave of Jarid ran away, and he caught and struck him in his neck, killing him. So basically. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to even comment on this. Like yeah. it's so despicable. This is it's crazy. It's crazy. It's, crazy. it's like yeah. 
the guy got mad at him for running away, so he killed him. And, and then it's it even just and then they tell us that slaves have rights, and they're why the hell would this slave run try to make an attempt to run away if he was so happy being enslaved by Muslims who were giving him all his rights and whatnot? Exactly, now think about this the psychological component is very important. Yeah. Here's another interesting one, and why this is interesting is uh, there's another hadith about this in uh, Ibn Abu Dawud, is also Sahih. So there was a blind man who had a uh, slave girl who had who used to uh, slander. So an Umay Walad, it's exactly what it says. He had a slave girl who gave him offspring, two sons. She used to slander and defame the Messenger of Allah to a great deal, and the guy master would tell her, "Do stop doing that." But she would not pay heed and she kept insulting the prophet and one day one night the master just got a dagger and just stabbed her and killed her and uh he went to muhammad and muhammad said uh, i bear witness that her blood is permissible and the man faced no repercussions for it he killed a slave girl just for insulting muhammad who was his sex slave i.e concubine mother of his uh Umay Walad. Uh, and nothing happened. She just killed, and Muhammad totally acknowledges and endorses it. Yep, crazy. It's crazy. Uh, this is from Tabi. I think it's Volume Five. Uh, here, this we showed this earlier in regards to uh, Zubair when he was uh, caught talking to us. The point here is. Uh, so when some of the captives from Banu Quraysh and Najd in exchange for them purchased horses and arms. So basically, Muhammad sold a bunch of people to buy weapons and horses from for himself he selected Rayhana, a woman from uh, uh, a woman from abanu amir and Quraiza, and she remained his concubine when he predeceased so she's his concubine his whole life apparently the messenger fellow offered to marry her and imposed the curtain and she said i don't want to be married to you i'll just be your concubine imagine well, put yourself in her shoes and think what she's going through this when the Messenger of God took her captive, she showed herself herself averse to Islam and insisted on Judaism. I think this guy just forcefully enslaved her and she doesn't want to become Muslim. She's showing her aversion to Islam. Okay. So the Messenger of God put her aside and he was grieved because of her. You killed her old pride. No wonder she's not happy with you. Then while he was with his companions, he heard the sound of shoes behind him and said, that must be Talaba coming to bring me the tiding of Rehana, acceptance of Islam. He gave, he came to him and said, Rehana has become a Muslim and it gave messenger of God a lot of joy. Do I actually believe she became Muslim? Absolutely not. Like I said, imagine yourself in her shoes. A lot of the times these kind of positions these people take is to keep themselves alive. Okay, she she tell, tells Muhammad, I don't want to become Muslim. I want to remain a concubine. I don't like Islam. Muhammad is upset and he puts her aside. She realizes Muhammad is the, the one in control. If she remains upset, no wonder what will come her way. So to in hopes of lessening the drama and the consequences she will face, she then says, okay, tell him I accepted Islam so he'll be happy and I won't face the bad ramifications of this. That's what I'm trying to say. Put yourself in these people's shoes. And that's why I keep telling Muslims, watch the show, The Hands Made Tale. You are being complete idiots when you devoid the psychological context. You have to put that in there. Uh, anyways, uh, I think we should take a call after this slide and see yeah. if it has. Yeah, please do join the um, the stream if you haven't, especially if you haven't done it before. Um, we're gonna, we want to take some new callers before we take the existing ones again. Uh, giving slaves as gifts. Okay, so can you explain this? Yeah, so here what happens is if, uh, so the woman from the Hudayl tried through a stone, a woman from the same tribe. So these two women are having this fighting and they're just throwing stones at each other, right? And this one woman had a miscarriage because the stone struck her belly or she fell, whatever. The messenger of Allah, bless him and grant him peace, gave a judgment that a slave or a slave girl of fair complexion and excellence should be given to her as compensation for the miscarriage. So here we learn that you can actually use humans as gifts to compensate. Islam is feminist, bro. 
<laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, this is a quote from uh, Jonathan Brown I was talking about. Yet it was not until they encountered European abolitionism in the mid 19th century that they, meaning the Muslims, considered eliminating riq, riq is the word for slavery, as an institution. Since then, Muslim scholars and intellectuals have developed a range of arguments, some mirroring Christian abolitionists, for justifying ending a practice that God and his prophet had allowed. So again, are humans better than Allah and his messenger? Are they more moral? Or is Islamic morality so outdated that we had to take the word of other humans and throw out the Islamic position, the halalness of slavery? And that's what bring back to is uh, you ask them, this is the thought experiment actually, if you get a Muslim caller, I want to do that with them. Mm. Uh, but let's take a call and yeah. see if you have somebody. Okay, so I'm there's a comment uh, about Zanj uh, Zebelian. Do you know about that? The rebellion of black slaves with the Muslims against Arabs. The I don't know. I haven't okay. read much about that. I don't know Zanj. about that either. So I'm going to take uh, Kalja Ranjit Singh. Hello, Kalja. Kalja. Hello. Hello. Kalja. Kalja. Ranjit Singh Kalja. How are you? And, uh, sir, I would hmm. sir, I would like to one uh, more demand uh, that when statues of uh, slave owners are uh, being uh, cracked uh, all over the world, whether in England or America or Canada or wherever else, then should not be a demand be made that uh, Muhammad, the slave owner, should be banned from the world discourse as well. well and the Quran should be sent to a library as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good question. And yeah, a lot of people are, have brought that same thing up. Uh, like I said, if, if you want to criticize everybody else in history that was partaking in slavery, why stop and not criticize Muhammad as well, right? And it's, a, big, it's a good question. Uh, for the statues being destroyed, like I said, there's I, I don't try to comment on political things, but my two cents is I would rather put the statues in, move them to museums and make uh, full-on collections for people to see that these people were the slave owners instead of destroying them. But then again, I can also see that the context and the emotional, the sentimental backdrop of certain people seeing the statues of slave owners and destroying those as well. So there's both sides of the argument. Um, I don't think I have ever come across a statue of Mohammed, but I did hear <laughs> that one kind of sculpture exists in this US Supreme Court where he's holding the Quran. Yeah. That's about it. Uh, and like I no, said, yeah, I agree with you. A book like the Quran should completely be sent to the library that has no place in the 21st century. Well, no, just as uh, just as Torah, uh, just as Torah, Manu Samriti, or Bible has been sent to Quran library, similarly, Quran should be sent to library for study. Yeah, we should yeah. study. Okay. Yeah, we definitely. Study. Okay, sir. Thank Thanks. you. Call. Thank you so much. Okay. So, um, if we have uh, anyone else who wants to call, please do call in. And if you're enjoying the stream, please consider sending a super chat and donating. Uh, it is most appreciated. I'm going to go back to the slides. There's not that many slides left. We can just finish them up now yeah. while we're waiting for the calls. Um, the Book of Financial Transactions, chapter selling animals for animals of different amount or quality, hand to hand. I don't know. Uh, the first problem I have is selling am, animals for animals, different yeah. amounts of quality, hand to hand. Okay, hold on. We have another call there. So let's take okay. the call and we'll get back to this. All right. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, hello. How are you? Hello, I am good. Uh, uh, sorry for my English. Uh, I'm not good at English, but uh, I will try. Thank you. Yeah. So my question kind of uh, is uh, similar to that of the before one. Uh, um, like uh, he said, he said that uh, uh, we, uh, why should not uh, burn Qurans and everything. Uh, I, I kind of uh, want to add that. Uh, why not reform Islam? Because reforming Islam is kind of a solution to this problem. Because uh, then more we more people will be uh, uh, more people will know about the problems and the uh, issues with the uh, Islam. So, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I'll do a quick one uh, on this. Firstly, I don't think burning the Quran or burning any book is a good idea. I say that even Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, shouldn't be burned. Instead, it should be studied and analyzed 
same with the Quran. Like, and these should be viewed as uh, vestiges of the past and glimpses into the history of our ancestors and how they taught and how they came up with their beliefs and ideas. But I wouldn't say burning the Quran is a good idea. In a sense, though, it could be made used to make a political statement. Yes, people do do that. It has that been done in history? So I do see that part of it as well. Reforming Islam. The problem with reforming Islam comes from the problem of very strict, strict uh, ideas around the Quran, which is elevated to the literal speech of God. So it doesn't leave a lot of wiggle room, right? Uh, but I do acknowledge that I feel ending Islam or expecting that Islam is going to go away uh, all of a sudden overnight is unrealistic. It's uh, not pragmatic. I feel like the progression of how Islam will devolve, well, dilute itself from more literalist to more Sufi and more metaphorical interpretations. And that's how it should be. And I would see people like Mufti Abu Layth and then even Yasser Qadi bring up these issues and slowly, slowly pull that dogma out of the, the Islamic uh, uh, creed and make it more, let's say, give it a more intellectual uh, backdrop. I would definitely love to see that. Uh, and like I said, ex at the same time, I do see the other argument too, where the existence of these people who give a very numbed down version of Islam can give cover to the literalists hiding and hijacking the narrative later on. Again, it's a lot. It's a deep conversation. You can have hours and hours of uh, conversation about what is true Islam. Is ISIS the only Islam? Even the idea that how do you define what Islam is? Do you define religion as it appears in its original sources? Imagine, remember that this is the Muslim view. Hold on to the Quran and Hadith and Sunnah. But academia does not view that because when dead people die, religion ceases to be a functional part of their lives. So what we go with is we see how. The people that are alive, religion for, uh, forms society and how it affects their life. So that's a functionalist view of religion. Uh, anyway, those are my two cents on that. I think I went on for too long. Hopefully it answered the question and confused you more. Thank you. Yes, yeah, that, that answered the question. And one more thing I want to add uh, is that uh, exactly as what you said, uh, reforming Islam will uh, also... Uh, have uh, one more solution uh, of the problem because uh, you know uh, here in uh, uh, subcontinent uh, there is uh, there is a lot of uh, you know uh, power gain uh, gain of power uh, because of Islam they mm -hmm. use Islam for um, gain political power gain. And yeah, they many many blasphemy just to get political gain. yeah totally yeah, but, yeah, yeah blasphemy laws yeah, yeah okay. thank you thank, thank you. you thank you okay Okay, uh, back to where we were. Uh, so this was uh, selling animals for animals of different amounts of quality hand to hand. I firstly have a problem with this heading of the chapter because it says animals, but we're talking about is slaves came and gave pledge to the master of Allah, did not realize he was a slave. His master came looking for him. The prophet said, sell him to me. So he bought him for two black slaves. Uh, so point being that this guy comes to Muhammad and becomes Muslim. And then Muhammad finds out later, oh, he's actually not a free man, but a slave. Instead of Muhammad returning him to his master, he says, hey, how about I give you two black slaves for this one Arab slave, right? Or one Muslim slave. The point being is like that one Muslim slave took precedence or was equated to two black people. And this isn't an isolated incident. This actually happened earlier, like we said, about Sophia. He gave seven slaves to get Sophia, right? Um, so I guess that the imbalance in value, and I mean, I don't, it explicitly doesn't imply that black slaves are of half value. It could just be that Muhammad only had black slaves in his possession. So that's the only two he gave to at the time. But we can definitely establish that slaves are not valued equally amongst themselves, nor put at the same value equal, equivalent to three men or women. And of course, you know, Muslims today, would see this and would be able to justify if they ever wanted to like if if the situation ever arose they would have moral justification for slavery right it's just like it's there in the quran it's allowed the prophet did it the yeah. companions did it it's uh they bought and sold slaves right so 
Yeah. All right. So rights of slaves, we kind of talked about this a bit. You know, you're supposed to give them food and clothing. Yeah, well, like Mufti Abulay said, even if you put them in a five-star <laughs> hotel, you kidnap them and you still have the power. It's still the same. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But they can't they can't run away. And you know, if they run away, they can be killed as disbelievers, and the salah will not be accepted if the Muslim if the salah will not be accepted, that means there's Muslim slaves too, right? Obviously. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what I want you people to do is read this part. And keep this in your mind, the rights of slaves, and then watch that TV series, Hands Made Tale. I kid you not, I cannot stress the importance of that series and realizing what actually went on and how slavery plays out with its psychological component. Uh, like Mufti Abu Lay said, you can put them in a five-star hotel there, you're still owning them, you can still force them, you have total control over them, right? So. Anyways, let's keep going. Do you, uh, do you know if Rehana's brother was still Jewish at the time of the death of Muhammad? It's a question from Weeping Prophet. Well, I'll have to look up, uh, I'll have to look up the Sierra books uh, quickly. I'll, I can make a post about this, but okay. I'll check. Uh, yeah, I'll have to check. All right, that's all I have in the presentation. Uh, so we can uh, basically mm -hmm. make some final comments. Uh, we've take more. Yeah, we can take a few more calls if there's any more yeah. callers that want to join in. If you haven't called yet, uh, this is your last chance, and then we will be ending the call. So, okay, I'm just gonna look at the comments in the in the chat for now. Um, let's see, what? Okay, let's let's take this one. How and what identity issues emerged in Indian subcontinent after Islam's entry into the region? And how its ideas transformed the region and Islam itself? I would listen to um, people that live yeah over there. I mean, we, we're mainly talking from the Western context. Um, Abdullah Gondal knows a bit, you know, can talk about Pakistan and how it was over there. Um, obviously, creating a state based on religion, I think, is a very dumb thing to do. And I don't think that we should be, you know, this is for the past now, you know, creating these sort of, yeah. you know, we need to be humanistic now. We need to put ourselves first. We need to take care of the environment, take care of the planet that we live on, take care of animals that live here, all conscious beings, you know, um, all conscious creatures, I should say. And this is what we need to we need to be united on 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 this not on religion on mm -hmm. color on faith on uh, you know these tribalistic sort of boundaries um that's that's my opinion on that uh, do you have anything uh, to add to that for, for me i would say that when islam came to uh the subcontinent what it did was it uh it colonized it to a great extent so what ended up happening was uh a lot like there was a Hindu culture, the Indian subcontinent culture by themselves, but then when the Muslim conquest came, most, uh, there was uh, a conflict where these Islamic values versus Hindu values. And also what ended up happening is Indians, Hindus, Bengalis, all brown people, Desi people are inherently the same. But they have been divided so much because of this religious difference. Uh, it just, it just baffles my mind. And it's a form of tribalism that keeps popping up. Like, for example, the whole point was to make Pakistan was to have a separate country for Muslims. But it backfired because there's more Muslims in India than in Pakistan, right? So it doesn't even make sense. Um, yep. And I, I feel it was a beautiful strategy by the British to divide and rule. As you, you divide these people, let them fight, and, you know, there's that. And to this day, we're fighting over these petty supernatural things which we shouldn't be we're the same people same culture even the same language for god's sake like come on yeah. i think um you know just something came to my mind that islam creates this super tribe of faith that is much even though it eliminated racism you know so to speak let's say i i will i'm willing to consent to you know give that point to islam that it does you know on the surface attack racism it creates a much worse system of tribal based superiority where you are basically superior to non-muslims in every way um and and that becomes a, it becomes a us versus them mentality right the kufar versus the muslim yeah. dar al-islam dar al-harb the abode of islam or dar salam and the abode of the disbelievers and there's a lot of antagonism the quran says don't take them as your allies and friends it it creates it 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 gets rid of racism but it creates something else that's even worse right it's, mm -hmm. it's, to me it's unfortunate um Okay, so we do have some guests. Hey, James, how's it going, James? Nice to see hey, you. Hey, James, nice to see you again. Hey, guys, great to see you too as well. Uh, yeah, great um, presentation you've done. I just had uh, one question on the topic, which was basically back when you two were both Muslims and 
how convincing did you find it? Uh, did you ever come across the kind of apologetic tactic of um, saying, oh, well, Islamic slavery isn't like Western slavery. In fact, it shouldn't even really be called slavery. It's more like servitude, kind of, uh, in, in Islam, you had to treat your slaves so nicely, and very often slaves even became kings. Like, I know, did, did you come across that? And how convincing did you find it back when you were in a kind of Muslim mindset? I'll go first. I, yeah, I found it very convincing. I didn't really look into it. I mean, that's a that's a problem with, I think, any sort of person that limits themselves to Islamic sort of, I don't want to say propaganda, but like if you're immersing yourself in Islamic everything, like you go to Islamic conferences, you listen to Islamic lectures, um, you you try to associate only with Muslims, you don't talk to non-Muslims as you know about these things, you you tend to become very one-sided, and then you don't you're not really critical. You hear something that sounds good. You know, some of these sheikhs um, have got away with a lot in the past. You know, they were making a lot of claims and nobody was countering them. Yusuf Estes is like, it's embarrassing the claims he's making. Like I saw a David Wood video where he was making claims about the Catholic Church right on the website has this. Like, it was. it's so funny the things he was saying. They're so wrong. But nobody's countering. People are like, yeah, yeah. And, you know, sometimes you see the Zach the Nike response videos. I do. People are all like clapping and you're like, he didn't even make a good point. Like, it's like, what is what is this? Um, the slaves in Islam sometimes became kings. Uh, Jonathan Brown actually brings that up in his book, too. And, and he does have a point that slavery means a lot of different things to Islamic his in Islamic history. And there are cases even among non-Islamic states where you have conditions, for example, in uh, he mentioned in the 1800s in in uh, Britain where, where you had this sort of employee-employer contract that was in some ways worse than slavery where if you didn't show up for work, you were like, you can go to jail for theft or something like that. So he gives some examples. So it's true there's other bad things in the world than just slavery, but we are holding Islam to a higher higher level because it's supposed to be from God. So when you say that, oh, but other people did this, like Mufassal Islam was saying, so what? Like, it's still bad. But whether anyone else did it, or it's still a bad thing, right? And so, I, yes, I was convinced by these things because I wasn't cr critical. And I think what we're doing now is we're trying to push back a little bit and hope, hoping that the dawah is not just going to be, you know, it's going to be. And these, again, I have to mention, these these institutes have millions of dollars of funding. Yakin has, you know, $3 million they got in the year before that, $1.8 million. They, their full-time jobs are to, are to put out apologetics. And, you know, there's people like Gondal and myself, we're doing this part-time, we're doing this on the side, and we're trying to counter these gargantuans, right? So it's it's a tough battle. It's an uphill battle for sure. <clears throat> for uh, my take on that, did I buy the Muslim apologetics? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, when I was Muslim, right? Like, and especially coming from Pakistan, uh, I keep saying that most of the Muslim world was uh, so intellectually isolated, and the internet has obviously brought so much more to light. But same with myself, was I would buy these arguments. Yeah, the Prophet had slaves, but he was so nice. And then I would remember the movie the message where there's a part where the slave can worse and he's so happy and so i would like play those and like you know what i had this uh, this fantasy kind of concoction of what slavery was in the islamic sense you know bilal was freed and he was standing on the kaaba but uh after i came to canada and i was like what 1920 right so i was still uh trying to understand the history of slavery and i got exposed to more ideas and it's only then I started uh, analyzing it more critically and then comparing uh, their answer. Okay, well, if these people are making this excuse that, okay, Muhammad was the man of his time, he could have done it and whatnot, and people were treated nice. Well, were there other people in history that made the same claim but also had slaves? So would their slavery be also be forgiven in a sense? So there's a lot of things, and over time I was like, I can't continue believing this. This just doesn't make sense. But one thing is that change of perspective coming to Canada, being exposed to different ideas is so, so, so important. And I think it's it, this is what the internet is doing now. I had this exposure seven years ago, but now people can be sitting in Pakistan and have this exposure on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And I, I hope it keeps going that way. It's logically kind of uh the the it's most stable like the belief is most stable when you have absolute certainty 
and then once that kind of like once once you're kind of you're compelled or provoked into kind of thinking things critically or like checking properly then it can it, then it will either unravel to probably atheism or very very liberal islam so and i think what you guys are doing is great and like sort of causing that tugging the thread and then people will start tugging the thread themselves and that sort of thing absolutely yeah thank you for your call james and uh thank you so much appreciate the support all right next question from thinker man hey thinker man um go ahead oh no i lost him okay well he he gave me the question in the chat if he comes back um, I'll let him ask the question. The question was, on what basis can you say secular morality is better than Islamic religious morality? Okay. So, we'll, so we'll start with that one, and then there's one more. Okay, so uh, one problem, one uh, subtle distinction I need to make before we start is what's the goal of the moral framework? Okay, Islamic morality isn't always about making the human experience the most the best possible that it could be a lot of the time the islamic morality is about not incurring the belief uh, the wrath of an omnipotent omniscient being and it's also to get his pleasure so a lot of the times you are arguing these two different frameworks are trying to achieve a completely different goal where the secular goal let's say you can go by axioms like uh i want to increase human happiness at an individual and societal level and help the environment let's just say this is your axiom right and people go off on that the problem is i have no problem accepting that yes morality is a subjective thing morality is like any other thing a biological adaptation that we humans come up with to help us survive in a changing world around us so the things change around us our moral values change to accommodate that change that's the beauty of secular morality uh, in anthropology, we keep telling people that there's a functionalist approach on morality. No moral framework is inherently better or worse because the words good or better don't really have a meaning in, in, if you go into the philosophical deep end. They all were there to serve a purpose, right? So for example, um, if the purpose of a certain belief, no matter how absurd, was to aid people uh, in, uh, survival by pushing them to let's say go hunt more then yeah that belief is okay there's this approach too now what i what i would say is is morality uh should not be second i think it's arthur clark that that said that one of the biggest tragedies that had happened in human history is morality was hijacked by religion and i'm going to do this thought experiment now and what i want to understand is religious people don't realize that they are also their whole moral framework is also subjective take this ask a muslim is incense objectively immoral if he says yes for example incense if he says yes then you appeal to adam and eve how can something be objectively immoral and then adam and eve doing it and if the god is omnipotent omniscient he could have easily avoided this thing but he chose to start humanity in this way right yeah and you see that the progression of morality from different prophets changes every time every holy book has different things even within the quran morality changes and evolves where you first were to like lock women in houses for mm. but then you have to whip and lash them and then stone them or the alcohol where initially it was okay then it was banned only for salah then it was completely banned the point is if to an external observer like me i'm standing here and i look at these this, this abrahamic moral framework i see a bunch of people in different eras of history erupting and making claims about morality but none of them are able to justify the objectivity of their claim or the existence of their deity which brings me back that religious morality in its true core is indistinguishable from moral relativism, but most people don't realize that. Um, in the end, what secular morality is, what do you even mean by secular morality? It's, it's, do you mean the morality of Stalin or Hitler or today's 21st century human rights? And that's what I'm gonna get back to is morality has always been is what humans have collectively agreed upon. Uh, and that's how it's always gonna be. Uh, and it will change. Like for, for example, uh, 
100 years from now, you might find that people viewing the modern 21st century industrial age as modern day economic slavery. You will see people like that, right? So the point is that I don't really see the moral argument as even a relevant argument for God. It's a complete non sequitur, okay? Um, at the end, this is my two cents. What I, what I would say is that humans have demonstrated that they have the capability of coming up with better, let's say in a sense, like uh, ideas on morality that lead to uh, greater happiness and life satisfaction in human society, but they also have the capacity to come up with the most bizarre, absurd, and nonsensical framework as we see in the Bible and the Quran and even in modern day, like Stalin, Hitler, and whatnot. Point is, we need to work together to come up with a, a framework that will increase human society, societal individual happiness and help our environment and deserve, ensure the survival of our future generations in a way that harms the least people and increases human happiness to the maximum. And again, I admit that these axioms that I am making are subjective, but that's all the best we've got. Mm -hmm. I think I spoke for a bit. <laughs> That's a great answer. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, think the man. Thanks for your question. Um, I think we'll just leave it at that. I know you had one more question, but thanks. Thanks for the the call. Um, does that is that good? You good with that? Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'll just summarize before we end this. Uh, yeah. So what we've learned today. Yeah, we're gonna give one. Uh, since there's one more person waiting, let, okay, let yeah, let's uh, just do the last. One. Hey, Hellbound is Kelliot. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. I yeah. I I don't know if you've actually heard of David Wood. Some of his criticism seems like he's just um of Islam just seems to be he's just doing it in fa favor of Christian apologetics. Mm -hmm. And like he actually I think he actually talked recently about the uh, the Barbary slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I heard that I've, I've, I've also heard that um, people say, well, the Barbary slave trade was worse because the, um, because the, the slaves that were actually traded were actually castrated. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, comments. What I, I would this. Uh, uh, I would comment on it quickly would be that yeah David Wood does levy a lot of criticisms against Islam, mm -hmm. but he stops right at Islam because most of his criticisms can easily be back projected onto Christianity, and that's the one thing I don't like about uh, when Christian people uh, end up joining this uh, this side of uh, side of things where they will be making criticisms, philosophically great valid points against Quranic stories or plagiarism or scientific mistakes or bizarre things Muhammad did and sex and slavery and uh, misogyny and whatnot. But the Bible, if anything, has more of that than the Quran or the Hadith, right? And that's what I keep coming to is fairness is very important. And I, if I were to ever converse with David Wood, if I make a point against Islam that does attack Christianity in the same equivalent way, I will bring it up because, like I said, intellectual honesty uh, should be what should uh, take precedence over your religious sentiment and affiliations. Yeah, I just, I've been actually hearing a lot about the Barbary slave trade and the transatlantic slave trade. And uh, Muslim traders, from what I've heard, actually traded with the European. Um, Slave traders. Yes, uh, actually, this is in Jonathan Brown's book, I believe. Samir shared something like that. What other thing was uh, if somebody mentioned this, like there was a huge rebellion apparently as well uh, from the black slaves against, uh, against the Arabs. And in fact, in one of the books, Jonathan Brown says like Muslim nations were amongst the last to abolish slavery, right? Um, what also comes to my mind is, although a, a Christian uh, slave here was bad, I feel like we're a point I remember, if I read this correctly, the church, the Pope said that black people don't have souls. I, I'm pretty sure this was said by the Pope 
this is in the infancy of the United States, uh, something along the lines where they were treated and then that led to them treating that as animals and whatnot. So like I said, both sides are evil. The Bible oh, yeah. definitely allows slavery. Yeah. The New Testament. I thought the New Testament didn't, but I had a call, um, an atheist uh, call, and she mentioned that even the New Testament talks about uh, slavery as well. And and religious uh, Christians uh, use this actually to defend slavery. And like Jonathan Brown says, all all religious institutions have been used in this way. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's definitely a problem with both the religions. Uh, actually, I think the um, justification for slavery in the New Testament comes from the book of Titus, I think. Let's see mm -hmm. if I can find it. Like, so, I don't know if it's Billiman. It's one so, of those New Testament. Huh? Yeah, so I was going to say thank you for your call. We're, we're running over the time now. We want to end the show. Oh. Um, uh, thank you so much for your call. Um, Gondal, do you want to take one more last caller or should we just end it now? Yeah, we, we can take one last caller and hey, then thank some right you, now. Thank you, Hellbound Thanks for the call and the question. Mike Dia, uh, hey, you're the last caller. You get the last word before the video. Oh, oh, oh yo, that was my destiny. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was waiting for that. We're talking about Kadr. That was my Kadr right here. Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, the thank you, guys. Uh, by the way, excellent presentation. Um, thank you. I just uh, wanted to say, um, especially Gondo, uh, I feel like he's been doing this since he was a baby. <laughs> but uh, just wanted to um, ask, how did you guys, it was more like a personal question. Um, how did you guys make the transition? Because I don't know if your wives are still Muslims. I'm not sure about that. But I was just wondering about the transition because recently uh, it's been maybe seven months now that I've had my crisis. And it's more like a personal crisis. And I haven't even, um, I, didn't, I didn't do the Ramadan this, mo uh, this month of this year. And even the prayers, um, I haven't been able to do them due to that crisis. So now it's, as you know, everything goes upside down when uh, these type of things happen to you. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, uh, how did you guys do that? Because I've always seen myself with, with a Muslim and now I don't know if I should go with a, stay with a Muslim and make up a disease for the month of Ramadan and say I have to take my, my pills because I'm diabetic. <laughs> Yeah, um, for the prayers say that I have knee cancer. I can't really kneel <laughs> and pray, you know. So I was wondering, what is your take on that? What can you say about it? Thank you. Oh my God, that's a tough question. Um, well, you, you, I'm glad you, you clarified that you're not already with anybody. So that's a different situation altogether than when you're with somebody. Um, if you're not with a woman already, I, I mean, I don't know. It depends where you're living and the situation. Is it a Muslim country? Is it a non-Muslim country? Um, can you clarify that? I actually uh, live in Canada, but I go back oh. and forth in my Muslim country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I would, I would. Okay. In that case, you probably I would recommend being honest about your beliefs. And I don't know if it's a good idea to get into a relationship with a Muslim woman unless she's liberal and secular and she doesn't care that about you. I mean, my old boss was Christian. He was married to a Muslim woman, and I was a little bit shocked when I heard that because that's not common. But if you can make it work, you can make it work. You know what I mean? Like, um, there's some challenges for sure. I I don't, I wouldn't recommend, obviously, getting a religious woman um, because you're going to have problems for sure. And problems might arise later on, even if they don't come right now. And sometimes people become religious later on in life. And then what do you do, right? So, but then sometimes people become less religious. Like, in my case, I was okay. We managed to work it out. Uh, faith isn't that much of an issue anymore uh, in my relationship, so that's a good thing. But I, I don't know. Everybody's different. Mm, yeah. Um, for my side, like how my family reacted and whatnot, um, initially, like it took me about a year to come to terms that, okay, I don't believe this. Like it was a year of research back and forth going to secular or like let's say non-Muslim sources, criticisms of Islam, and then back to apologetics, trying to justify what back and forth. Um, so the problem was like my wife is, uh, was a, she converted to Islam, she's white, she converted way before I even met her. So she was a convert Muslim and then I was uh, becoming uh, ex-Muslim and slowly what happened was uh, I was not sure if I should tell her or not because I feared that, okay, if I tell her, she might just leave me because then if you become an apostate, your marriage ends and you can't be, and you'll be a fornicator, right? So there was that. And, but then I was also contested, but that'd be so wrong that if I don't share my thoughts and things with her. Eventually I posted online and came out of her. Her first reaction was like, yeah, I might leave you. But then eventually we talked through it. And then a few months later, she left the religion too. Uh, 
I would suggest that uh, avoid getting into a relationship with a religious person unless, like Samir said, they are liberal in their views, kind of like a cultural Muslim, which is fine. Because a lot of times I understand like your parents, uh, <laughs> your parents might want you to marry somebody from the same culture and whatnot, and you want to please them and you don't want to bunch of things right so you can find somebody that might still be in let's say pakistan who still identifies as a muslim but when they come to canada with you they can live a happy like full of pleasures and party and whatnot but again like some years that or a lot of times what happens is these non-practicing muslims come to western countries and they get super attached to their prior culture and they become more religious so keep that in mind too yeah that happened to me like you can say i was a like secular ismaili and i became a religious conservative muslim um it's honestly it's such a difficult question by the way i i forgot to say you know congratulations on you know following your heart and yeah. you know like it's it's inspiring to see that you're actually able to have the courage to like leave you know religion behind when you found out that you know I don't know if you have doubts or you're not Muslim at all anymore, but I mean, this is an honorable, this is a great thing to do to actually, you know, th when they say you guys are causing doubts, yeah, we're causing doubts. Doubts are a good thing. Go yeah. You know, I mean, it's, be it's better to be less certain than, than more certain in life about anything. And knowledge is, you know, it helps you. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else to add to that, but yeah, thank you for your call. And um, I think, I think, yeah, just, you know, play by ear, see how it goes. And, um, Try not to get, just be, I guess the best thing to do is just be honest about, you know, what mm. if you can, if you can be honest and try to look for someone where religion is not an issue. I know ex-Muslims, one of my very, very good friends, he's with a um, Muslim, like he found a Muslim and she's even a hijabi, but she's not Muslim. I mean, she's atheist pretty much, right? But she wears hijab around her family still. And that's perfect for him because his parents and, you know, are happy to see that he's wearing a hijabi. Yeah. <laughs> so it's perfect like ex-muslim hijabi with ex-muslim guy i mean that's amazing sometimes you know things don't always work out so so well like that but just just be honest and try try not to don't be dishonest because it can backfire you know what i mean unless you're in a very difficult situation um you know where you have no choice and then even then try to lean towards less religious um but yeah that's that's all uh and like i said you're gonna be last call man uh i'm sorry but we are not taking any more callers. Uh, it is not in your cutter yeah. to the show today. Right. It's, it's gone on uh, yeah, two and a half hours. Uh, so thank I, you. Yeah, Mike, uh, Abdul Gondal, you want to make any final comments before we end? Uh, I, I just want to summarize the presentation and whatnot and then conclude. Uh, my concluding remarks would be that uh, we've learned today that uh, A, Muhammad had slaves. He had black slaves. He had uh, sex slaves. He had concubines. Uh, not one, but a few, uh, and he had kids with them, okay? His wife didn't like him having sex with concubines. We find that Muslim men would use concubines uh, and then discard them when they got pregnant. We also find that Sahaba would go on wars and become so horny and perverted that they would uh, capture women to have sex with them, but pull out because they still want to ransom them after, and if they get the pregnant, then the ransom value decreases. We also find that Muslim men and uh, Muslim army exchange slaves for horses and weapons. Um, we find that slaves were killed and nothing was done about them for merely insulting the prophet. Um, so in all putting everything together, Islamic slavery at the end of the day, yes, it might not be sometimes as bad, but at the end of the day, it was pretty bad. I mean, you cannot uh, say that these sex slaves were loving, they wanted to be slaves, they want to continue in slavery, or that these women whose husbands and tribes that you've slaughtered, you want to have sex with them the same day and they'd say yes to you. That's delusion. So at the end, it was, it was like I said, it's slavery is, is, is not a religious problem, I think. It's a human problem and and it keeps popping up in different faiths and different regions of the world in one shape or form or the other, right? And I think uh, wherever it is, whoever does it, no matter if it's Prophet Muhammad or Abraham or George Bush or Trump or Obama, whoever does slavery, 
or took part in it or condones it in any shape or form should be called out uh, for it. At the end, I would say that my last sentence would be your beliefs and convictions should be proportionate to your evidence. This is one thing that uh, I feel religious people can reiterate as a mantra to themselves that your beliefs should correspond and scale to the to the level and caliber of your uh, evidence. At, uh, at, with that, I will uh, say goodbye from my side. Had an amazing time uh, talking about these issues. Uh, we could obviously spend so much more time going into details about the history and we were just mostly focusing on Muhammad and his time of slavery. But if you want, like some years going through the book uh, from Jonathan Brown, where he counts a lot of accounts of this, uh, the historical slavery found in the Islamic empire. Uh, so Samir, any last closing remarks from you? Yeah. But that's all from my side. Thank you. That was amazing. You speak very well. Um, Final comments for me, I'm just going to mute. Final comments for me are that Muhammad, the last and final messenger of all mankind, the best man of all uh, creation, the one who Allah corrected when he went wrong. I mean, how do you square that with what we just showed you? Like, never mind Aisha being a child. Let's say you, let's, let's dispute that. Let's say she wasn't a child. She's 18. What about everything we just mentioned? What about all of these issues? um you know that we've that we've just brought up it's just it's just a lot it's just there's a lot of things to to unpack there for someone that's supposed to be the last and final messenger you know the the perfect man how do you, you cannot reconcile these two things there's just there's there's just um so i uh, thank you all for the for the uh for the super chats and the donations uh, please subscribe if you're new here and uh, we'll see you next week, hopefully on the third episode. Um, if you have any comments or suggestions on what you want us to talk about, please reach us, reach out to us either on Facebook or Twitter or even email. Um, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.